Um, <clears throat> thanks for coming along to tomorrow, uh, this morning's meeting. We've got a very, very busy agenda, so I'm just going to go straight in and ask for the sederant apologies, please, Julie. Thanks, Provost, and good morning, members. Provost Jim Todd. Yeah. Councillor Stephen Canning. Present, thanks. Councillor Ellen Field. I'm here, Julie, thank, thank you. you. Councillor John McFadgen. Here. Yeah. Councillor John McGee. Here. Yeah. Councillor Elaine Cowan. Here. Councillor Maureen Mackay. Present, Julie. Thank you. Councillor David Richardson. Present, Julie. Thank you. Councillor James Adams. Councillor Lillian Jones. Here, yeah, Julie. Councillor Ian Linton. Yeah. Councillor Douglas Sheet. Yeah. Councillor Graham Barton. Here. Yeah. Councillor Graham Boyd. Here, Julie. Here. Councillor Barry Douglas. Here. Yeah. Councillor Neil Ingram. Here. Yeah. Councillor Peter Mabin. Present. Here. Councillor Claire Maitland. Here. I have an apology from Councillor Beverly Clark. Councillor Sally Cogley. Here. Councillor Kevin McGregor. Here, yeah, thanks. Councillor Linda Holland. Yeah, thank you. Deputy Provost Claire Leach. <coughs> Councillor William Lennox. Holland, here. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Alison Simmons. Here. Yeah. Councillor Billy Crawford. Here. Yeah. Councillor June Kyle. Here. Yeah. <coughs> Councillor Jim McMahon. Here, Julie, thanks. Here. Councillor Neil Watts. Uh, present. Councillor Drew Filson. Councillor Filson. No. Councillor Jennifer Hogg. Here, thank you. And Councillor Eileen Stewart. Here, yeah, thanks, Julie. Thank you. Thanks, Provost. Thanks, Julie. And uh, thanks for those members that are uh, done with the lurgy, but uh, they've came online. So it's, it's affecting everybody's sickness, bugs and things. And can I just say to members, um, Councillor Beverly Clark has uh, suffered... Um, a bereavement in her family. Uh, her granddaughter has passed away. So Beverly, uh, thanks everyone for the well wishes, and uh, and hopefully she'll see you in the new year. Uh, but she passes on uh, our thanks for all the, uh, the well wishers that have uh, tried to contact her. Um, we wish Beverly all the best, um, folks. Uh, I'm going to ask that the order of business be amended today and that we take the items on the Commander strategic vision before the report on community power, place and partnerships. Is that OK? But all fits better that way. Folks, uh, remarks just very quickly. Uh, <clears throat> lucky enough to go along with uh, the chief, uh, the boss, Farouk Hussain, and Arusha Irvin. Some may, might recognise her from Bargain Hunt the telly. Uh, Arusha's from Kilmarnock. And it was great. She was delighted to come down and meet all our talented youngsters that are involved in the Salt Eye Awards for Forward Together. This is an anti-sectarianism organisation that youngsters have expanded at challenging bigotry and racism. So good for them. And uh, they, they do a great job. Go to Northern Ireland every year to research uh, racism, bigotry over there. And uh, they do a great job. Remembrance Day, again, um, we surpassed ourselves, as we always do, all up and down our communities, and we stood in silent reflection, remembering all those that gave the ultimate sacrifice. And we will continue to support our veterans and serving members. Scotland's Towns Partnership Conference, 16th of November, uh, centre stage. Um, <clears throat> this is the organisation that looks at changing townscapes and uh, how uh, shops can, uh, and businesses and uh, the general public can come together to work to make the towns uh, a lot better. Uh, it was a great conference, um, and we hope that during uh, lead up to Christmas, everybody tries to shop local. I know you can't always do it, but it'd be great to give them uh, a bit of support. Showman's Guild of Great Britain, uh, the annual luncheon in Glasgow, 18th of November. Uh, these are showman's families. Um, who are absolutely in, uh, integrated into Scottish society. Um, all remember the Mayfair and the communities. Uh, you used to go as a wee boy, a wee girl, and enjoy the rides on the shows. Uh, they, I hope they go from strength to strength because they're renewing uh, all the stuff that they do. And the Showman's Guild of the United Kingdom in the Second World War bought and paid for five Spitfires out of their own pockets and umpteen ambulances for communities. 
So they really are an essential part of what we are all about. Police Scotland uh, Awards, Ayrshire Awards Ceremony, 23rd of November, and it was great to meet all of the work that uh, hard-working police officers are doing and members of the public that help keep uh, all of the folk in Ayrshire safe. And it was great to talk to some senior officers about some ideas they've got for the future. Watch this space. East Ayrshire Sports Council and Talent Athlete Awards evening. It was great to get down there and see some of the folk that we've been supporting for all these years. Um, those that don't know, um, those athletes that uh, can get to podium at national, international, Commonwealth and Olympics, uh, get supported through uh, this talented athlete programme, financially and with resources, and the payback as they come into our communities, our sporting communities, and help our young folk. So good for them. Here's your hospice, light up a life, Christmas concert at the Grand Hall, 27th of November, and uh, there was not a dry eye in the house because they had uh, a brilliant montage of all the folk that have passed this year with wee messages from them, and I knew a few of them. So the hospice is going doing massive refurbishment, and we're looking forward to see the results. And I was up at Edinburgh for the Veterans Housing Scotland Annual Review, um, and it was all of the stuff that uh, housing officers and organisations all up and down Scotland, what they are doing to support our armed forces in relation to housing. So uh, a bit of busy time, and that was uh, uh, OK. That's the comments. So I'm going on to declarations of interest on page two. Um, we've all been here before, but I'm going to ask David just to uh, elaborate on uh, the new arrangements we have. David. Yeah, the revised code that came into effect in January of this year uh, broadened out the dispensation for council appointments to outside bodies. So just for the record, those members who are on the Galleon Trust and the East Ayrshire Leisure Trust don't need to declare now under the code because those are council appointments and are therefore already on the record, if you like. If any other member has any other interest in any other item that doesn't derive directly from a council appointment, then now would be the time to announce that progress. Cheers. Thanks very much, David. Councillor Douglas. Thank you, Provis. Just to declare an interest to item 10, which is the LDP2, in that my employer, uh, as a member of Homes of Scotland, have commented on the LDP and I will not take part in that part of today's business. Thanks. Thanks, Barry. Any other members? But OK, thank you. Uh, I'm going to go on to item two, which is the previous minutes, council minutes, pages three to six. Uh, I'll move the minutes as a correct record, including the addendum to the member officer working group item. This is shown at page five of your papers. And the addendum to item 10 on the learning investment programme shown at the end of the minute on page 10. Thank you, Provost. Thank you very much, Deputy Provost. Uh, members, any questions? Take me a wee bit longer now because I need to look at the screen. But OK, right. Thanks, folks. On to item three, and this is the Cabinet Committee minutes. And I'll bring in uh, the leader. I think it's on block. Yeah, Provost, if, as previously agreed, I'll, I'll move on block. But I just highlight that uh, this includes the uh, addendum to the Cabinet minute of 23rd of November uh, on item five uh, on the Housing Investment Plan. Thanks, Leader. Deputy Leader. Agreed. Thanks, folks. Any questions on uh, Cabinet Committee papers at this point? We're OK. Thank you. Item four is a six monthly update on Cabinet activities from the Leader, pages 86 to 92. Leader. Thanks, Provost, and appreciate Donna running in my glasses there at the last minute. <laughs> OK. Um, yeah, it's just the, the, the usual report that's in front of us, uh, highlighting a number of uh, particular issues that came through Cabinet. Uh, first one is the, pleased to be at the, the opening uh, ceremony for the, the start of the Dunlop early Childhood Centre, once I found it uh, in Dunlop uh, in the Lugton Road, uh, this will be the, 
the last of considerable investment we've had in early years uh, right across East Ayrshire and uh, again uh, developed the pacified standard and driving uh, our net zero ambitions. Uh, also in education, uh, the devolved school management scheme uh, empowering head teachers to meet local needs and deliver the best outcomes for young uh, learners in line with our objectives and uh, curriculum for excellence. Uh, GIRFEC and Early Years Framework, uh, leading the way in, right across you know, other local authorities are looking at this. Uh, the Shared Prosperity Fund, uh, this was bringing over £6 million pounds worth of investment into uh, 13 projects across our communities, uh, making quite a substantial bit of uh, difference rate across East Ayrshire, maximising the economic growth for the area. Uh, item 12, uh, paragraph 12, Onwards is the place based investment program. Uh, seen a, a total of 26 projects uh, with over a million pounds of support of community lead, uh, led regeneration across East Ayrshire. And I've uh, been delighted to see quite a number of these. And uh, these, are, these projects have been extremely popular, and we look to roll out more of these in future years. Uh, most timely thing, probably, in the cabinet is the spot response to the cost of living crisis. Uh, September approved uh, £2.2 .2 million of spending to help support families and business get through the cost of living uh, crisis. I mean, we, we're seeing this now more than ever. Uh, and just recently, we, we, we gave out information to parents about the, the new uh, child bridging uh, payment, which a number of families will be uh, able to apply for and help them just Particularly now, as, we, as a, the temperatures are dipping, uh, this, this is uh, very timely indeed. Um, the housing uh, land audit, which looked at the, the next year's uh, housing supply for the uh, for the next five years, and uh, how, how that what the housing allocations works with the uh, East Yorkshire Local Development Plan, and uh, that's hopefully taking forward some considerable growth right across East Yorkshire as well. Delighted to uh, announce the new plans for the new education development on Onthank area in the northwest, uh, built on the current Onthank Primary Mount Carmel Primary, uh, and involving the the, uh, the community in this exercise, and you know hopefully uh, bring in an improved area and a growing part of the uh, East Ayrshire and Northwest Kilmarnock. Uh, in terms of place place making, place plans. Glad to see uh, further work on in Ockin Lake and Priest, uh, Darwin Priestland uh, as a as the latest, and uh, obviously, obviously hope to do more in the next next six months. But it's great to see this this program uh, expanding right across the area. Uh, in terms of early learning again, I, in terms of allocation policy and criteria, which is often uh, controversial, you know, as places are limited and where parents are, uh, are looking to place their children, uh, we're delighted to announce that the 95 uh, of eligible children are taking up their early learners uh, place and that further plan developments will support more children to access funded ELC, uh, including the law that I just mentioned earlier on. Um, in terms of investment in housing communities, uh, we announced a, a programme of £103 million uh, to ensure that our communities have access to good quality and affordable homes. Uh, the housing investment programme, the HIP, has seen an, an investment of £68 million, which is, means that 3,500 homes have been installed with new energy efficient systems. Uh, 1,700 uh, homes have now got new kitchens, bathrooms and electrical upgrades, and uh, 13 Hundred homes have benefited from new external render insulation and external envelope enhancements. And my goodness, they need them don't they, just now. Uh, and hopefully, that will help to lower uh, fuel bills at this time uh, and right, right around the, the year. Uh, also, we were able to announce future uh, house building uh, programs through the ship, including, we mentioned here, uh, Bridgehouse Hill, uh, Road in Kilmarnock, and absolutely delighted to see. You know, developments from previous ships, people moving into their houses just in timely uh, up to Christmas and, and we'll own more up at uh, Witch Road and tenants are absolutely delighted with their new houses 
Uh, and that's, that's something we're really pleased to see. And also in terms of recently we managed to visit uh, uh, the new site at the, the former college uh, with local members. And we saw that uh, some uh, the tenants move into the 10 new houses that were built by the housing developers on that site. And uh, that'll be some of the first of many of that type of housing to go to people on the waiting list. So there's uh, quite a number of things. In terms of the other other uh, reports, there was the Gypsy uh, Traveller uh, Service Provision, where we had an analysis of negotiating stopping uh, policy that we've had, and uh, the, uh, that evaluation process, and we're looking to see how we uh, we, we meet the needs of uh, Gypsy Travellers as we, as we go forward. And that was part of that paper. And uh, last but not least, uh, climate change and submission the Climate Change Public Sector Report uh, was pleased to announce that the Council's own carbon consu uh, consumption had dipped, but was able to uh, report uh, action and how the Council's own uh, carbon uh, consumption will dip even further in the years ahead to meet uh, targets. Uh, for uh, renewables and uh, the, the temperature ta uh, targets, climate change targets for the net zero targets for the years ahead. So quite a wide range of things that we've been doing there uh, and need to see the involvement of young people uh, in that process and uh, look forward to the next six months. Thank you, Promise. Thanks, Leader. Members, questions? Thanks, Prof. It's not so much a question, but just comment, obviously, in, in my capacity as a, the housing spokesperson, the amount of work that's, that's been done in the last five years continued today. I think it's really vital that we push ahead with that uh, house wrapping project and insulation projects, especially at this time of the year. Uh, the benefits that that should make to people should, uh, I mean, they do have a measure that, but uh, I know there, there's lots of savings going on within households. Uh, touching on the cost of living in the paper that came around about the cost of living, may I say that never, they know that the, the warm spaces are needed. We're seeing that with, with frozen pipes and houses and outside Scottish water bursts. So the, the, these places are invaluable and uh, pay tribute again to the people, the volunteers within the warm spaces that's opening them up as well. Uh, if it wouldn't be for them, these spaces wouldn't be open a lot of them. So just again, thanks to them. Thanks, Jim. Councillor Douglas. Thank you, Provost. Uh, question for the leader. Uh, on page 88, uh, they're responding to the cost of living crisis, whilst absolutely we in the Labour Group uh, welcome any moves that will support people who are vulnerable in these really difficult times. And we're seeing that particularly uh, with the winter weather, as Councillor McMahon ha has mentioned. My, my question really, or comment, is around the, the warm banks and how we are ensuring these are getting you know, used as effectively as they can be. They've been promoted as much as they can be. I'm sure members are all sharing everything for their own words and beyond on social media. But I uh, remain concerned, certainly from, from anecdotal evidence of some of the Warren Banks in the last couple of weeks. Tendencies appear to be low um, and just making sure that we are targeting the, those most in need to make sure that we can assess this further. And I think as we move beyond Christmas, um, we might see an uptake in this. I think there are a lot of people who will be focused, rightly or wrongly, on, on Christmas rather than maybe the immediate needs of, of being warm uh, and staying well. Um, but if we can make sure that we are absolutely reaching those most in need with a view to potentially um, looking at changes that could perhaps directly support people um, as we move into uh, more into the winter in January. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'll ask um, Annika for comment on that one. Thank you, Provost. Um, you're right, the numbers were low at the start. We are promoting them both on our social media and website and also on the councils. We've done a, a push on that over the last week because of the, the cold weather and we are seeing a greater uptake this week in particular. We are monitoring it as we go along to make sure we're providing what is needed in these spaces and we'll, we'll change things as we go and as people need them. But yeah, we are seeing an uptake this week more than, than we have previously and we will continue to monitor that. OK, Barry. Yes, Provost, thank you, Annika. If certainly you can keep members updated, even with, you know, attendances, these sort of things. And just to make sure we really are reaching because there are people who clearly it would be 
difficult for them to leave their own homes to go out in minus eight and nine degrees to get into a warm space that perhaps there might be people we can do some work with directly at home. So any information we can share uh, with members would be really appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Leader. Thank you. No, Barry's absolutely uh, right to raise this and you know, we've got to look at best practice where we can. Uh, I st sometimes still worry about you know, some of the stigma, you know, come to a warm bank. Folk are, you know, folk have got, seems a wee bit undignified, you know, uh, much as though, you know, and, but we know that people are having that real choice of heating and eating just now. And the recent community planning partnership, uh, the representative from the, the, the CVO, we're saying that uh, food bank donations are so much down that absolutely, uh, you know, came to a halt, and that's something that should really concern us all. So we we need to, you know, have that balance of where we have the support. But uh, it's it's terrible in this day and age that it's it's been left to local authorities to a large degree to 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 mitigate that, uh, this uh, situation. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Mash and cheers, Provost. Leader, I'm really happy to see the place plans yet again mentioned for Oakenleg as a ward member, um, somewhere also that I have lived uh, the majority of my life, somewhere I'm really passionate about uh, within my ward. Um, I thought it was really interesting, yet again, going into communities and asking people what they're wanting uh, and how villages such as Darvo and Priestland have very different priorities uh, that uh, all can let. And, uh, after one as a ward member, I'm really looking forward to working with community groups and also individuals within a community that are not yet involved in some of the groups that have absolutely fantastic ideas but maybe just on the sure how to get involved within the community as a conversation I had last week with somebody and seeing how as a community we can collectively really drive forward a lot of this stuff in partnership with councils and organisation because I think things like this are the things that can make a real measurable difference to people's lives and communities such as Open Lake and, and, and Ball of Mel. So again, really, really trust to see that. Thanks, Leader. Thanks, Claire. Councillor Jones. Thank you very much, Provost. And it's really just in the back of what um, Councillor Douglas and the leader um, was saying. Um, I think it is terrible that it's been left to local authorities um, to be able to provide warm spaces, etc., for, for those most vulnerable and those um, most struggling with their bills. Putting food on a table or paying for the heating, it's absolutely shocking in this day and age. But just, just on that, um, given that we've those that have spoken have made reference to the cold weather snap. Um, I've got real concerns about us promoting these warm banks for people to come to when there's ice out there, black ice, you know, slips, trips and falls. Um, at this time of year are the greatest presentations at a &E for our health colleagues to be dealing with. And really the advice that our health colleagues would be given these people would be to stay indoors, don't come out. So on that vein, um, I think consideration to a more direct approach to help these people. Um, we really need to look at that, ways, ways, ways to do that, support people when they're in their homes rather than coming out, making their way to warm banks and maybe have a wee slip, trip or fall and find themselves in hospital. That just wouldn't be good at all. So it was really just to, to flag that as an issue for me. Um, and I would be happy for thoughts. Thanks. No, you're absolutely right. Lillian, um, luckily I think we're going into, uh, after the weekend, a, a warm spell. It's not a warm spell, but it's uh, no freezing. So hopefully that will alleviate some of the issues that you're raising. But you're absolutely right. Uh, we need to be careful that those folk who do need support and can't get out of the house, uh, but I think our teams are onto this, and they know those folk that we know about. There will be people who fall through the safety net. I've helped some of them as well. Uh, but the ones that we know about, We'll make sure that uh, they're looked after either by conversation through a phone call or a visit. And uh, I think we can, we can't guarantee everything, but I think we can make sure that we'll try and uh, reach those folk that you're talking about that are not able to help themselves. Okay, Councillor John McFadden. Basically, on the back of what Councillor Jones and Councillor Douglas were saying, I was just thinking on exactly the same lines. And I was wondering, you know, because so many people might be reluctant to come out because of the weather and they may have an accident, you know, is there any thought to try, trying to create sort of voluntary transport, you know, maybe contacting the people that are running the, the warm hubs and seeing if local people might run other people back and forward or whether 
we can use any of the school transport or we could get a donation of any of the taxi companies, maybe the ones that are running the school contracts to move a couple of people. I mean, basically just along the same lines as what they're saying. I mean, the warm banks are a good idea, but you want to be able to get back and forth to them safely. And you don't want someone sitting freezing at home simply because they're frightened to go out. I mean, facilitating the warm banks is, is as important as having them. Yeah, thanks very much. Through you, Chair, you know, these are really good ideas and we're looking at everything. So our, our job is to try and do everything we can to serve. So we've got 63 of the warm welcoming spaces up and running, run by a range of different people, including leisure, the council, communities, CVO, a whole range of churches are involved as well. But if they're not accessible, the really good thing is that through Kevin um, Braidwood's service, we've got over 100 winter resilience groups now who are out doing the gritting around there. So what we can say to them is if they can grit round about the warm banks to try and make, because we would love people to go there. And there is no, we're not calling them warm banks, we're calling them war welcoming spaces because we don't want the stigma. And you can get a cup of tea, but there's activities and things there. So there's a real opportunity for connection away from isolation. It's more than just a heat, it's actually much more than that. However, we are absolutely aware that some people feel more housebound or they're a wee bit frightened about walking when it's really cold. And through Vibrant Communities, we learned so much during COVID and we have Kind, Caring and Connected. That's up and running right the way through the festive season. And it's a number that people can call. And if they're really stuck, we'll make sure they get the help they need. Um, and obviously augmenting that is the work we do around community alarms and the work that Craig's, Craig's service runs. So the most vulnerable people will absolutely look after. There's an emergency contact through Kind Care and Connected and when people need something we'll get it to them but we would love to get more people if they can come to the warm welcoming spaces because this is about communities connecting together there isn't a stigma and actually you know the other day when we lost water supply to come up we opened the town hall and it was it was a really good um, um, response we got the people were pleased that it was available to them that we could do that so we are promoting them but we will also tie that closely with the winter resilience groups so that they're out doing the spread and, and getting that going and we'll make sure that happens. We've got a cost of living oversight group and that meet again for the final time next week just to check that all the festive arrangements are in place, that services are working in tandem with communities and that also you as members are updated in terms of what's happening. So before you stop, you'll get a kind of link of everything that's available over the festive season and how to access that. So, But we're always open to ideas here and yes, the council is a big part of the coordination and leadership here, but we're going to have to rely on each other or communities, our groups, our businesses to work together to support each other during these tough times. Thank you. Uh, Peter. Thanks very much, Provost. Uh, just you when know, I see this cold, uh, the, the cold spell just now, and when temperatures, temperatures are at minus six in Kilmarnock, God knows what they're like in Muirkirk and Domelton. Yeah. Uh, you know, so, and I know this is, you know, while we'll all be welcoming a, a, a bit of heat being restored to the communities, this is always, always in particular, when people are struggling to heat their homes, this is always the area where you get problems with burst pipes, particularly when you get such a, so we could have a perfect storm in the, the run up to Christmas, but it's just anything we can do to give out kind of advice and assistance to people. Because, uh, you know, I saw, in, as you do in YouTube and some of these folk, particularly in their, in their waste, and it's fine to put a kettle over your waste, uh, but no, put over your water supply. Uh, I mean, that's just uh, asking for bother, uh, you know, in terms of cracking pipes once the, the thaw comes on. So, uh, you know, we could have our work out in the run up to Christmas, but it's just, uh, uh, if that advice could be forthcoming, that'd be great. No, thanks. Uh, Councillor Mackay. Uh, thank, thanks very much. Uh, first of all, uh, Leader, uh, what I, I would want to say is really to applaud the housing service. I've had reason to contact them twice already this week and the response that I have received in relation to constituents in terms of particular needs that they have uh, caused by this uh, cold snap has been excellent. Uh, and again, I think at the end of the day, you know, we are the right people in the right place to be able to respond. And that has very much been there and, and echoed. Um, thank you, Katie, for what you have said about the resilience groups. However, it's quite interesting uh, listening in terms of the expectations for these resilience groups. 
Uh, I certainly have had contact with several people this week about resilience groups. And what people are very interested in doing is very much sort of looking after their own areas. And I know that we do have a winter resilience plan and ARA has a winter resilience plan that we have accepted. But it might be that that's something that needs some tweaking around at this particular time. Because again, I think one of the things that we know is where the priorities are uh, within that winter resilience plan in relation to housing areas, which are exactly the areas that we really do need uh, that, that gritting done within. So perhaps, you know, looking at that, against this introduction of this new policy that we have in relation to warm banks is something that needs to be matched up. Uh, Annika, you talked about the fact that attendance had been and uptake had been very low. Uh, again, I think it would be really interesting for us to get a sense of figures about that, to for us really to get into some detail about what's working and where it's actually working. So that would also be useful. And then leader, just again, to try and move things forward quickly, just a completely different topic. And that is to ask uh, the Shared Prosperity Fund, uh, do we have a result uh, from the Shared Prosperity Fund yet? We do. I, I I think we, we do, actually, but in terms of the details, I can pass that to Katie. Yeah. I mean, I think we could go into detail, but they got the full amount and David was delighted with it. So that as presented to Cabinet, David, I don't know if we need to keep handing back to each other, given the agenda, but we've yeah. got awarded the full amount. Right, and we, we'll bring back a report in due course, just setting out how that's been implemented. Thanks, Chair. Report's coming back, Maureen. Did you hear that? Uh, yes. Uh, thank you very much, Provost. I did. And I, it was just to absolutely confirm that because it wasn't clear from the report. I think we heard that the other day at the Economic Forum. So, yes, that's positive. Thank you. Thank you. Members, any further points, questions? I think we can absolutely encourage and support the resilience teams and all the work that they're doing. And the more support we can give them, we will. I'm going out to help out over Christmas period and I know that a lot of other folk, if they can, are doing the same. So so good for them. Um Maureen, you've got a legacy up. You went back in. Sorry, it was just to ask for a response in relation to Ara. I was expecting the Deputy Chief Exec would have something to say about that. In relation to what? To Ara. Yeah. And the winter resilience plans that ARA have in relation to the uh, warm banks. Yeah. Yeah. You pro through you, Provost, um, we do have a winter resilience plan um, and I can work with Kevin's team and, and Blair's team to have a look at how we tie the two together. Thank you. OK, thanks for that. Now, if there's no further questions, members, I'm going to move on to item five. This is the annual Treasury Management Review, and uh, we'll bring in Joe for this. Joe. Joe's going to, uh, okay, with members, we're going to take item six and seven together. So that's annual Treasury Management Review, and then the Treasury Management Mid Year Update Report. Joe's going to do both, but he will identify when he's making a split, and then we'll take questions after that. Five and six together. Joe. Thank you. Five Provost. and six. Thank you, Provost. And good morning, members. And it's uh, reports five and six on your agenda papers today. And as Provost said, there are there are two Treasury management uh, reports on today's agenda due to the timing of the end of the external audit by Deloitte. The first report begins on page 93 and provides an overview of our Treasury management activities that took place during the financial year 2021-22. The second report begins on page 106, and this report provides the mid-year update on our Treasury uh, matter since April this year. And it's this second report that picks up the upheaval that's taken place uh, in the financial markets in, in recent months. So do two, two reports together, Provost, and that will cover the, the last 18 months. 
as I said, the, the Treasury Management Review for last year begins on page 93, um, and it starts by noting that their council approved the, the, the revenue and the capital budgets for 2021-22 in February 2021, and in doing so also approved the Treasury Management and, importantly, that set of prudential indicators that you that you provide and approve that, that, that encapsulates the Treasury report as we go forward. The report notes at Table 1 on page 94 that the Council had estimated capital expenditure for the year of £84 million, but elements of this expenditure were reprofiled, and as such, only £57 million of capital expenditure was incurred. Spending less than planned on capital means that the planned borrowing requirement is also less, and the table shows that our borrowing requirement reduced last year by around £30 million of that, as a result of that reprofiling. You also know, members, that when that takes place, that's also recorded in our East Ayrshire performance reports, with members being asked to approve that report of filing. And in this case, that was reported and approved by Cabinet in the period 7 East Ayrshire performance report in November 2021. Page 97 shows the Council's underlying need to borrow, known as our capital financing requirement, and notes that this prudential indicator as well as all, all of the other prudential indicators that you set were complied with during the year and reviewed as part of the external audit. The report also shows that the Council is using its reserves to fund capital expenditure in the short term. This is known as being underborrowed, and paragraph 25 shows that our underborrowed position for that year was around £90 million. The prudential indicators that, that relate to borrowing are shown in Table 5. And these show that the, the financing costs as a percentage of the Council's net revenue stream highlights that just over 6% um, of the income is used for the general fund, is used to repay debt with the corresponding amount for the housing revenue account being just under 18%. Members will also recall that the recent medium term financial strategy contained a section solely on capital expenditure and, approve, and asked for approval to review the overall affordability of our programme. This review is progressing well, and the outcome will be presented to the members in, in the next few months. The remainder of this first report highlights the borrowing and investment rates afforded to the Council and provides details of the investment counterparties where the Council places funds in the short term. It's this back end of the first report that tells the story of an economy in the last year in 2021, which was post-COVID restrictions, but pre the war in Ukraine and a year in which we saw inflation begin to rise sharply, and all of this before the more recent um, financial turmoil. Provostin members, that then leads me to the second report, to the more up-to-date Treasury Management Report that begins on page 106. This details um, fairly um, detailed information, from our, principally from our Treasury advisors, uh, on our Treasury arrangements since April this year. The mid-year report comes at a time when there's been significant upheaval and uncertainty in financial markets caused by a, a number of reasons. The report therefore contains a large amount of information on the market conditions that were that we were that were in place in April this year and in the months ahead. It's a report where our Treasury advisors provide fairly detailed analysis and update on the wider economic environment and of the interest rates and guilt rates that were so important a few months ago that changed dramatically in that short space of time. It's a report that provides some stark updates on the impact of government fiscal policy and the resultant impact on financial markets, all of which had an effect on our Treasury positions and on the decisions that we took in managing our debt and our portfolios. As members are aware, our Treasury advisors provide a range of advice and supports aimed at facilitating effective Treasury decisions now and into the future. They note that even with the upheaval that's been seen in the last few months, they expect interest rates to rise and then fall in the medium term, which is especially helpful given the Council's underlying need to borrow as the capital programme progresses. Whilst we have continued with the strategy to underborrow, which results in a gain between the difference in borrowing costs and the difference in interest rates for our investments, the report notes that we took the opportunity to borrow uh, recently to repay a short-term loan and to reduce our underborrowed position. And I, I just alert members that probably some further borrowing will be taking place 
uh, in the next few weeks. Essentially, this this second report, which is unique in its in its contents, has some key messages. It highlights the volatility and certainty that existed in financial markets in the last few months following the mini budget. It also discusses the revisions to that budget following the appointment of the current Chancellor of the Exchequer and the further fiscal changes that took place as part of the recent autumn statement. It lets members know that there is relative calm um, in the markets as a result of the overall Treasury management environment uh, and because of the changes that took place in the autumn statement. The Monetary Policy Committee meets at lunchtime. Every likelihood that interest rates will rise by half a percent. The Treasury advisors tell us that they will rise, but they will fall again in the medium term, probably to somewhere around four, four and a half percent, which is a lot less than we had envisaged at the start of, of this financial year. With all of this going on, I'm pleased to report to Council today that even with the uncertainty and upheaval, the prudential indicators that you approved in February 22 as part of the budget continue to be met. There remains, however, an underlying need to borrow, and this will be reviewed as part of the, the normal Treasury activity in following the review of the capital programme. We have set specific trigger points with our Treasury advisors where we will enter the market and take borrowing. And that, that in this year, uh, similar to last year, the capital expenditure for the general fund and for the House and Revenue account are likely to be less than anticipated due to slippage in the programme, details of which will be presented in the next East Desk Performance Report to Cabinet. Members, I'll stop there. The recommendations for the end of your report are on page 93, and they ask Council to note the contents of that Treasury Management Review. The recommendations for the mid-year report are on page 106, and they ask you to consider that report and note its contents. Provost, um, I know that's been a fair bit of information covering the two reports, but I'll be happy to stop and take any questions. Thanks very much, Joe. I'm going to open it out, members, for questions. Councillor Linton. Thanks very much, Provost. And can I take this opportunity to thank Joe and all his staff for continuing to monitor what our things Financial upheaval, I think you called it, Joe. I think you've been very, very kind. I mean, it's, it's been an incredibly trying time. Um, we've seen that how decisions taken elsewhere have a direct impact on how we go about our business here in East Ayrshire. And, you know, as, as we all know, every year we have to deliver a, a balanced budget, and it's really, really important that we keep on top of this. And I, I'm extremely grateful, as I said earlier, to you and your staff to continue to monitor. It's such a high standard. It's it's really reassuring. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. Uh, Councillor John McGee. Right. Hey, thanks, Provost. Hey, just to echo the sentiments of Councillor Linton, I mean, it is a great job that Joe's team is uh, doing. Given that uh, I'm led to believe we're always in the outer envelope of affordability where it came to borrowing, if the interest rates have risen so much and are going to rise again today, how, how can it be that it's still affordable to us? Thank you. Through you, Provost. Um, the, 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 the phrase cusp of, of affordability was used uh, some years ago, and it's a, a phrase that's, that's hung over the capital programme, I think, ever since. I think it was a, 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 the proper phrase for its, phrase for its time. Um, and I think, um, given the descriptions that, I've, that, that are contained in these two reports, and given that, that Treasury isn't just financing ICT, and I'm grateful to the positive comments that were made for the team, but it also, it's also in facilities and property management who drive forward that programme, that um, you know we have taken steps in the medium-term financial strategy in conjunction with Andrew and colleagues to say we'll have a review of the affordability of that programme. That work uh, took place immediately after that approval in October. Uh, we've got a position where we think in, in a financial sense um, we can we can take that forward. We are very very mindful of the ambitions of this council in terms of its capital project, um, and you know it's a council that 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 does make effective spend. It does, as as others have touched on, um, try wherever possible to meet climate targets and the like. But it is also one where um, as interest rates rise, um, then we are mindful of that phrase around affordability. It is, however, something that you know we we are. This is a long-term approach, so it's heartening to see that in the medium term, 
indications are interest rates will fall back down again. They will, they will never go to the 0.25 that that's gone, but they'll go to levels which which will be a lot, a lot lower than they are today. But that that point on the affordability of the programme is something that council gave approval for. Um, we met several times, we met um, colleagues in facilities and property management this week, meeting again next week, with a view to bringing that revised capital programme for 23-24 to council in February alongside the budget that will have far more details in terms of the, the affordability of that programme and the steps that Andrew and I will take, supported by us, to bring that in. Thanks, John. Councillor Richard. Hi, Joe. Just the just for my own uh, sort of knowledge. See, when you talk about going into the market to take borrowing, Joe, what type of rates are available to the council? For instance, are you going and taking deals at uh, a markup over base rate, or are there fixed rates available, or is it a collar and cap type deal? When you take borrowing on behalf of the council, what type of what I would call product are you taking the borrowing on? you promised. Um, I think in years gone past, maybe 10, 15 years ago, there was a whole lot of answers to that question. Um, nowadays, um, the, the rates, uh, it's beyond vanilla. That'll mean something to you. It's it's it's, it's very boring. It is no, it is no different. It's, it's just simply going to the, the Public Works Loan Board, which is an arm of the Treasury, where we um, essentially place an order to take some money. We get the money um, five days later um, in our bank account. It is a fixed rate. We've taken £25 million at a rate of 4.1% for 50 years. Um, and uh, that's what we're doing. We'll go back into the market. We've set a trigger point, not at a 4%, but at a 3% rate. And if rates hit that level, we're going to take some more money. And it's just um, bolstering our position. It's December. We are due to pay back a, a, a short-term loan we took from another English council. Uh, earlier this year that we were paid this month. So we'll repay that money and we'll, we're, we're deciding now whether we take some further short term money or whether we go long. But in this occasion, we, we went long. No, I'm, I'm really pleased to hear, Joe, that uh, fixed rate borrowing is available because I, I can understand for, especially a man in your position, how that makes budgeting a, uh, a lot easier. No, thank, and obviously, if rates then do rise, we're protected against that. So it's good to hear so fixed rates are available. No, thanks, David. Members, any further points, comments? Can't see anybody. We're going to move on. Thanks very much, Joe. And how lucky we've we been here at East Ayrshire with two maestros with finances over the years. So well done to you and the team, and we really appreciate what you're doing. Right, thanks. Uh, item seven, folks. Uh, it's East Ayrshire Leisure Annual Performance Report, and that's over to Annika. Thank you, Provost. Um, I'm just going to give a, a short introduction to the paper and then I'm going to ask Robert to work his magic and play a video for us. Um, what I'm presenting today is our ninth annual report. Um, it covers the period 21-22 and it was appro approved at our AGM on the 4th of October. Despite ongoing COVID restrictions that we had in 21-22, we have shown significant recovery and um, it's all credit to the team for that and the way that they've welcomed communities back into our venues and worked really hard with communities to make sure that we respond to what they're needing um, in that post-COVID recovery period. I have put some summaries in uh, paragraph 7 to 18, but I'm not going to go through them in detail because you'll get a feel for it from the video that we're about to, to show. A couple of things, though. Um, during that period, we have worked really hard on our sustainability and our future. We've developed a number of strategies that will support that. We now have a financial strategy, a digital strategy and a collection strategy. These are all new pieces of work for us, but also give us that sustainability into the future. We were pleased that once again we received a clean audit from our, our external auditors this year. We turned out um, with unrestricted uh, surpluses of just over £455,000, which is fantastic. Um, we've, what we've done with that is we've, we've designated it so that we can invest in our services and our equipment so we can continue to be modern, to, um, to respond to the communities. Sorry, Robert. <laughs> Um, and we were able to achieve the savings target that the council set us of 190,000. So it was just a quick introduction, but if you don't mind, Robert, we'll just get that plane from the start again. Thank you. They help me.
our community better because as a charitable organisation, they are set up to do good. Every penny they make goes back into local facilities like gyms, swimming pools, parks, museums and libraries, or to create new programmes communities want and need, like health walks, concerts or programmes to keep us all fit and healthy as we get older. And with a combined turnover of £2 billion a year, that's a lot of money going back into the local economy. Trusts don't have shareholders and they are not private businesses. You might not have even heard of them, yet people visit their facilities 414 million times every year. They work in partnership with local councils. They listen to communities. They are transparent and they're run by board members from the local community. Why do they do this? Because all of the 100 plus trusts across England, Wales and Scotland share a passion to improve social, mental and physical well-being. And the difference they make together is remarkable. Improving people's health and well-being means reducing the cost of treatment and care later in life. It can help reduce crime and improve educational outcomes as well as increasing personal happiness. That carries a social value of £1.5 billion. This is your local Leisure and Culture Trust. We are proud they are our members. And because our members sign up to our Charter of Integrity, you know when you work with a charitable trust, you can trust in us. This house is now a litany Things I thought I'd never be Man who has opinions on an ottoman Among other things I used to think I'd miss the road The crushing fame, the sold out shows And I'd just sing head, shoulders, knees and toes Like I'd forgotten them But I'm alive Baby, I'm thriving Yeah, I'm living my best life. I wake up with the sunrise. It does not look a thing like I thought that it would. But I've been getting my steps in. And I sleep with my best friend. It's the best that it has been in a long time. I'm living my best life. Sometimes this sucks to tell the truth and I took it hard like people do But I'm learning how to eat the fruit that is in season Never thought I'd be a grown-ass man But you know what they say, a best laid plans Now I'm holding on to my daughter's hand I've got a reason to be alive Oh yeah, baby, I'm thriving Sometimes this sucks to tell the truth and I took it hard like people do But I'm learning how to eat the fruit that is in season Never thought I'd be a grown-ass man But you know what they say, the best laid plans Now I'm holding on to my daughter's hand I've got a reason to be alive Oh yeah, baby, I'm thriving Wake up with the sunrise. 
sunrise looking at things like what the actual hell but i've been counting my blessings now i sleep with my best friend it's the best that it has been for a long time it's the best that it has been for a long time i'm living my best life Thank you, Provost. So that is, it's hard to look back when that was a year ago's worth of work um, and so much has happened in, in that time, but I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. No, thanks. Uh, thanks, Annika. That was lovely. And the music was okay as well. Well done. Uh, Council Maitland. Thank you very much. Love a bit of entertainment in the chambers and a little bit of music. Um, I would like to thank Annika and her team and to congratulate them for all they have done for our communities in these difficult years. And they've done it with enthusiasm, which is infectious. We are still very much, however, in recovery from COVID. And now we're facing the cost of living crisis. And uh, East Ayrshire Leisure Trust is not shying away from this challenge. During these difficult times, we look to sport, to leisure, to entertainment and our outdoor spaces to help us with our well-being individually and collectively. To constantly, successfully balance income streams with the health and well-being of our communities is an incredible challenge. So I'd like to thank everybody, especially the Finance and Scrutiny Committee, for their very tight oversight and their ability to even build up the reserves as we go forward. As um, we face an uncertain financial future, I am reassured the Leisure Trust will continue to serve our communities and to manage our resources with resilience and imagination and people at our heart. And next year we go into the 10th year of the Trust and I look forward to seeing how the Trust builds on its previous successes. However, I'm most excited as an ex-box office programmer that we're getting a brand new box office system and it's actually going to join the 20th century, never mind the 21st. So really looking forward to next year. And again, thank you, Annika, all your staff, from my, all of us. Thank you. Thanks, Claire. Councillor McFadden. Yes, I'd like to thank Annika and her team for all they do and for the report. It was always very interesting and I liked the video. Almost every year I've been a councillor, I keep raising this particular issue at one or other place or time. I still think the we need some sort of electronic messaging board or multi-use display board round about the Palace Theatre that tells people what's going on, both in the Palace Theatre, the Grand Hall, the Dean Park or round about. Because from what I can see, Ticket purchase is usually an impulse thing. All research would point to that. And most people see something and buy a ticket to whatever it is within the preceding 24, the, the following 24 hours. And the number of times, you know, my wife and I have been to something in Kilmarnock, then, you know, because we're in the garage business, there's a lot of people through the door and a lot of people want to chat. They'll say, what have you been doing? Where have you been? We'll tell them, Oh, we went to see this in the Palace Theatre, the Grand Hall, or some other part of command. And that, oh, we didn't know anything about that. And predominant, I mean, we really never actually find someone comes in and says, "Oh, I went there too." It's almost always, "I didn't know anything about that." And so, to sum it up, I mean, I had one sadly passed away customer who was quite glib and would sum things up very, in very short terms, whether they hurt your feelings or not. And after about couple of years of hearing where my wife had been with myself to you know see things he walked in one day and my wife told him where we went to see x y or z in the palace hall and he turned around to me and said john what goes on in Kilmarnock is about the best kept secret i've ever heard of and i thought well that sums it up so i have no idea why we don't have 
something that some electronic messaging board. All the other theatres out through the country have billboards, electronic signs in the front. They all they all seem to have a requirement to sponsor and support what they're doing and make sure people know. Yet we don't. So I seriously think we should consider having something there outside that theatre or on the grass near the viaduct or somewhere that everyone can see what's going on, what it costs, when it's on, because that's just my opinion. Well, that's a pity that, uh, you know, people like that and yourself, but I know what's going on all the time because I look for it, you know, um, and I accept that maybe some folk who aren't looking for entertainment don't see it. But I know what's going on all the time because I'm in really quick. It was a rock band at the, the Grand Hall and I buy the tickets straight away. So if you're looking for entertainment, you'll find it. I think there's a lot of advertising going on. But that's a point I'm sure the uh, Leisure will go away and look at it, see if there's some time an electronic board. But thanks, John. Uh, Councillor Mackay. Obvious, thanks very much. Um, I think the point that Councillor McFadgen makes is, is actually certainly, certainly something that we should take on board and, and is worthwhile uh, listening to. Uh, could I just ask a question of Annika? I, I want to say, Annika, again, really well done. Uh, you know, I absolutely loved and I have people who live out with the East Ayrshire who absolutely loved the Grayson Perry and made it an absolute destination to come to Kilmarnock to see that exhibition. So something really special and it was absolutely wonderful. I was in there more than once. Uh, and it was fantastic. And I think that's just a snapshot of the amazing work that has been done. I know that nationally what we're seeing is a real downturn in relation to the, the changes that we've got and the economy crises that we have across the country. Uh, again, it looks to me from this report as if we are actually managing to buck those trends. I'd like to give Annika the opportunity to come in and to place that and to place what we are managing actually to do within that national context. And again, perhaps share with us any of the particular concerns that she is aware of nationally and how that translates to East Ayrshire going forward. Thank you. Annika, are you ready for that? Do you want time for a report to come no, back? No, okay? that's fine. I can respond to that one, certainly as an, an overview of that. We work very closely. We're members of Community Leisure UK, which is where the, the first video came from. And I thought it was important for you to see the first video, to see the impact that trusts, and we're not the only trust that providing leisure facilities in East Ayrshire, but how important they are and what they can do. We're part of that group. Um, which is a national group, and they have recently just done an insight report to, to see where uh, Leisure Trust sits, um, not just in Scotland, but across the UK. In Scotland itself, there's a 91% 91 of Leisure Trusts in Scotland are showing real concern and are concerned about their future. We are not in that position. We are bucking that trend. Um, we are managing to build up our reserves. Our numbers are increasing. We're back to pre-COVID figures. And the reason for that is we've worked really closely with partners, including environment communities and the council, um, to, to respond to what the community needs are. We are not the big private gyms. We do not, don't provide gyms in that way. We respond to what the communities want. We're at the heart of the community and each of our venues is dealt with differently. So we've developed a new model for our gyms, which other leisure trusts aren't doing because they're still focusing on the big high impact modern approach to gyms. And that, that whole attitude towards uh, leisure has changed. We're also responding in terms of our arts and our performance spaces as well and doing those differently. We're introducing cultural hubs so that there's more going on in libraries. We're going away from the whole shh approach to libraries and making them now more of a buzz when you go in. Um, so we're looking at how those venues are more than libraries. What else can they offer? A great example is um, Stuart and Area Centre come the 1st of April. We'll, we'll also have a heritage centre in it, which we've been able to work with the local history group and putting it in, in a heritage centre. We'll also be introducing a community cinema. So it's responding to the community needs and making more of our venues. We've got fantastic venues and we need people in them. Um, and that's how we're responding. And I think that's why we're bucking the trend is because we're responding to what the community want from us rather than trying to strive all the time for that high impact 
um, approach to things. Yep, thanks. Uh, Councillor Linton. Thanks again, Provost. It was really in response to, to John. I have good news in my, my role as the digitalisation spokesperson. That's about a mouthful. Um, um, Kilmarnock is good to be the first provincial town in Scotland that will benefit from uh, BT's in-link. These are these massive, big, rotating advertising, the electronic screens that you see all around about Glasgow, um, where you get free Wi-Fi and phone calls. It's paid for by advertising. But the good thing about the deal that Joe Staff have struck is that the council and by, by then, the, the Leisure Trust will get slots on these advertising boards so they can be targeted to go. I think there's going to be five, I think, for recollection, Joe and Kilmarnock and round about the town centre. These can actually be used individually or they can all put out the same advert. So we'll have slots on those, those, those you know, things that size out in this big stainless steel, you know, they're up 10 foot high. So that they will hopefully address the concerns that you've, you've rightly raised. Oh, thanks for that. Uh, we've got another few folk in. We've got Leader, then Councillor Douglas. Thanks, Provost. Uh, on quite Sunday morning there, I was held down by one of my older constituents uh, and a friend held me down and I thought, here we go. Uh, and she says, no, Douglas, it's no complaint. Can you tell your leisure staff that Dean Castle is absolutely remarkable? I mean, uh, there's three or four of them went up to see it and they were absolutely they've invited their friends down for uh, down for Glasgow and uh, really wanted to pass on so I've done that there very publicly. So and I've you know I've had a look at the light show and some of the things that's on uh, and I know Count Council Bart was clicking the number of folk that was coming into Dean Castle recently. So uh, we know there's been quite a number of folk that's been attracted to that. And just other wee, a couple of wee things. Uh, I think Maureen men mentioned the Grace and Perry. Absolutely, uh, it was a great. You know, it's, I'm no. That's no usually my scene, but I, I could have spent hours looking at the tapestries. They're just probably could something was today with Sunderland football and things like that. But they're really uh, interesting social statements that, that, that uh, as well. And great to see you know with the coffee bar and the the the, the, the Dick Institute isn't as not only sh as the cappuccino machine maybe, uh, and that's that's good to see. Uh, and maybe uh, last but not, I'm sure really interested in that wee, a wee bit of detail there because I know there was Jason that spent loads of time trying to do the inventory, and you've got an rapid inventory because I know that's for sometimes was an issue that we 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 have the, you know, we don't have a record of what we've actually got and we've got quite a lot, uh, and I'm just want to hear a wee bit more of that for Annika just because I think that's, that's been a great thing, you know. Thank you very much, Annika. We'll just carry on. Councillor Douglas. Thank you, Provost, and thanks, Annika, uh, to you and your team. Um, as I've often said, the Panto really is my favourite part of the year, favourite part of the festivities, and it's amazing how many people come from far and wide to enjoy the Panto in Kilmarnock. So from that point of view, uh, uh, you know, let's continue to support it and, and continue to have these fantastic events uh, in the town and beyond. Certainly in the Dean Castle Country Park, and I think I haven't been along to to see uh, the, the the winter show as yet. I will be going along this week. I'm really looking forward to it. I've heard some really positive feedback, um, which is excellent to hear. And I have to say, I think also quite clever timing because it will build an interest ahead of the castle reopening in April. And I know there is a real buzz around that. Annika, I just want to say uh, thank you for the report. I do think your best days are still to come and uh, keep up the good work. And yes, if we can use any means possible to promote what we're doing, we should do so. I know you're absolutely prolific on social media. I share as much as I can as well. I'm sure other members will do the same. But yeah, anything that we can get that promotes what's going on within our towns and villages. And I hear what Ian has said in relation to um, these these. Uh, Sign, uh, digital signboards are going up across Comana, but could we see these rolled out elsewhere across our towns and villages to make sure people are absolutely aware what's on in their doorstep because we have some fantastic cultural assets and it still even amazes me people born and bred in Comana who haven't been, for example, into the Dean Castle or, or don't really know what's on at the Palace Theatre. So uh, thanks again. Thanks, Barry. We'll carry on. Annika, thanks. Uh, Councillor Boyd. Thanks, Provis. Yeah, just thank Annika for the report and yeah, a lot of great things I've got and I think building into the future there's a lot to look forward to. 
Um, I, like Councillor Barton, I was at the Dean Castle the other night doing some clicking three hours out in that cold, I'll tell you. Um, out of interest, um, between four and seven o'clock, we got to 978 people going through. So that's probably if you project that on for the night, there's over a thousand. So that's quite interesting. Um, so it's all good. It's, it's brilliant, um, the light show. Um, just to build on Councillor McFadgen's point about advertising, um, what I call the town green in front of the Palace Theatre, there's a large grey pole, which is no being used, and I remember Palace Theatre banners on it for the panto, etc. No, I know they can maybe act as a cell and the wind blew off them, and I could be able to confirm that one way or the other if that's a problem, but we're not making use of that. And the volume of traffic that goes down Green Street, it certainly catches your eye. And I know I've driven past um, years ago and you've seen it and you thought, oh, yeah, that's interesting, that's on. So I'm just wondering, can we use the pole? Is it maybe the kind of sail factor with the wind? And if we're not going to use it, maybe we'll have to remove it. Simple as that. Well, we'll let, we'll let the, some folk in and then uh, if that's if you... Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, I, I think it's a matter of uh, inclement weather. It's like the floodgate. Hey, the floodgates. We close them in the winter, and I don't think we could make sales up when it, the storms are coming in. Uh, that might be uh, getting used more in the summer months. But we'll we'll carry on, and then Annika can sum up. Councillor Richardson, and then the leader. Uh, just a couple of things. I'm very very pleased to see in the report that um, you know the footfall, the number of players, and going round Adam Hill Golf Course has increased. Uh, both my sons have taken up the game, and uh, Freddie especially has played Annan Hill a number of times this year. I think I played it once in the summer, and I was pretty impressed with the, the condition of the course. Um, one thing I would I would say about that is, Ayrshire's got some really good, what I would call, accessible golf, like what you know, ordinary people can afford to play. I know that Caperton's no longer um, East Ayrshire Leisure. I think it was taken on by the members, but I've played Caperton during the summer. It's in good nick as well. So in the town, we're really, really really fortunate to have two good golf courses, Anne Hill and Caperington. Um, South Ayrshire, so they're, they're, they've got obviously the courses down in Troon, the council courses, uh, you know, Darnley, etc. Um, Lock Reed. Anne and Hill, I think, Ayrshire's got, Ayrshire brings a lot of money in through golf. I mean, you've got your your Turnberries and your Troons, etc. They bring people from America to play. And maybe there's a, maybe we could tap into that because these guys are coming over to pay, to play the you know, the, the high-ticket courses and what have you, the, the big-name courses. But they're here for a week at a time. So maybe we could tap into that. Because Annan Hill's a decent track. So they're going to have days where they're maybe twiddling their thumbs. And maybe we could get some more, um, you know, some more um, some more business there for Annan Hill. But great to see that the numbers are going up again because uh, uh, it's a great asset, both Annan Hill and Cape and Blue Town. One thing I would say about the Grand Hall is if we give the people what they want, then they'll come. Because recently we had the proclaimers in the town and I couldn't get a ticket. So I think basically the proclaimers could have done about three or four nights in Coman and sell the place out. So if we can get the if we can get the acts, if we can get what the people want to see, then the Grand Hall will pack itself out. It's just getting the getting the attractions, I would say, getting the getting the things that people want to go and see. And last thing, just as other councillors have said about the I've not actually seen the light show at um the winter light show at Dean Park yet, but people are actually talking about that. I mean, it's so good that people are actually mentioning it to me, the fact that they're going to have to get up there and see it. I think, you know, the Dean Castle lit up as a sort of like Hansel and Gretel gingerbread house or something like that. People are actually talking about it. So again, that's, uh, you know, if, if you provide things that people want to see, then they'll turn out and they'll go and see it. Thanks, David. Leader. So I was, uh, I was just going to make the, the minor point, just in terms of the the poll at the town green. Uh, that was that, that was Annika's predecessor. I could uh, come up with that idea. Just but I'll get the, but uh, I think you know that, there needs to be something done. Uh, just it doesn't seem to be able to hold the the banners and folk wondering if it's a spaceship or some kind of, but a public art, you know. So, uh, yeah, fair point. And then Councillor Cowan. Uh, thank you, Provost, and thank you, Annika, for the report. I, I just want to take the opportunity to express my thanks to the very talented Dean Castle textile team. Um, they're just one example of the amazing talent that, that they do have within the Leisure Trust. Uh, definitely looking forward to some um, future ambitions and aspirations that the Leisure Trust is looking at. And picking up the point, 
from leader on the inventory. Any opportunity we can to get some more of that inventory out on display and even if it is relevant to local um, other areas across um, the authority to, to get them rehoused and on display would be fabulous. Thank you. Uh, thanks, folks. I'm going to ask Annika to sum up if you feel the need. I would like to thank you, Provost, if that's okay. If I can start with the torpedo, as we like to call it within the Leisure Trust. Um, it's not used because we were always we were always scared that we would end up with banners down the river, as we did frequently. So we have been working with the ARA to see if there's a different way we can do it, with different materials. And we're going to trial it again with uh, Chaos, who are doing Sister Act in March. So there will be new banners going up, different material, and we'll see how that goes, because it is a great space for advertisement. Um, the castle and the collections of the castle, the rapid inventory, it's the worst name of a process I've ever come across. Um, however, we have completed the rapid inventory. It just took us 15 years. Um, we do now know exactly what we have in the collection, how many items we have and where they are and what, what they're worth. So we have 140,000 items in the collection, which is fantastic. Um, I would love to take you on the wee tour, but the spaces are quite confined, so it would need to be in small numbers. However, we do have plans to get them out because having a collection of that size, which has got international uh, status for a number of the collections, including the musical instrument and the Burns collection, it is really important to our local communities and there's no point in it being in stores in the Dick Institute. So we have plans. We are planning to repatriate a lot of our community collections into local spaces as part of our cultural hub programme. Um, and that will start with Stewarton in, in the spring, but also looking at Golson Town Hall, Darville Town Hall and others throughout um, where there isn't a museum. We've got a bigger plan though, to get most of it out on display and that's all subject to external funding and it's a business case that I'll bring back in future future months. Um, the castle uh, projection has been well received. We've had over 10,000 people through the, the clicking. So thank you to everybody who's volunteered to help us with that. It is part of a, a festival though, and we do have community projections happening starting tonight. So tonight at Rose Riley, there will be a, a community projection tomorrow night in Delmellington and on Saturday night in Cumnock. Um, and then just finally, uh, golf. We've got a few wee bits and pieces to do in Annan Hill, and then we will start really pushing Annan Hill because the course is looking great. But there's a wee bit more we want to do in terms of movement of greens and some drainage, and then we'll start pushing that one. My final plug is I save the date. We are opening the castle on the 31st of March, and so invitations to that um, celebration will be coming out in the new year. But thank you very much. Thanks very much, Annika. Councillor McMahon. Thanks, thanks, Provost. Thanks, Annika, for the paper. Oh, brilliant paper again. Uh, I'm glad to see some of the upgrades work that's been done on the River Air Walk, save me tripping and falling and stumbling, uh, and likewise some of my, my outdoor colleagues as well. For, for me, and I'm glad you brought that infantry now, because it's a point that's been raised quite a few times in coming up run about the Miners Memorial Monument that was in the old precinct prior to its demolition. It seems to have disappeared. It might be within that infantry you've got somewhere, so maybe if, if it is there, you could uh, kind of let us know. And if it's no more important, then let us know. Uh, Annika, just as a golfer, if you're good at uh, change the layout of the track, Anne and Hill, um, for me it was a better layout when the first tee was at the old house. Because when when they moved the first tee to at uh, the new clubhouse, you start off with three holes where you march up and down the same hill. But the, the more the more interesting part of the course is over towards the Grange Estate, and it was a much better layout than the first tee. The first hole was the one where you drive away for the old house. So just just a wee input for a golfer there, Annika. Right. No, thanks for that. A good walk gone wrong, in my opinion. But if it floats your boat, that's great. Good for the golfers. Can I just say, um, Annika, uh, absolutely blown away with the Dean Castle. I went up the other night and I would encourage everyone to go tonight if you can before the weather changes because it may be winter outside but in my heart it's spring and the courtyard was absolutely amazing really warm feeling and uh, the courtyard looks incredible and I'm looking forward to uh, a lot of things going on in there in the future months and uh, just to say talking to the folk that organise Ayrshire uh, Hospice and they're looking to bring a big name I'll not say it in case it doesn't happen and I'll be buying tickets straight away and it would be great to have a blues festival in the Grand Hall Jimmy Vaughan, that would be great uh, but thanks very much, please pass on all regards, 
Uh, please, everyone, take your families up to Dean Castle tonight or tomorrow night before the weather changes because it's far better seeing it in the winter setting than the pouring rain. So well done, Annika. Members, recommendations on page 120. We're happy with the recommendations. Thanks, Annika. Uh, we're on to item eight now. Sorry? Oh, it's change. I this is change it. So we're on, we're taking the strategic vision first. Is that us? So this is new item at item eight, command strategic vision. And uh, Claire is going to give this report for the integration action plan. Thank you. Thank you, Provis. Good morning, members. Members, this paper is presented to you today to provide a strategic vision and direction for all of Kilmarnock to manage the broad range of complex challenges facing towns and town centres across the UK and to build on the positivity that we've just heard about from members this morning about the best days being still to come. As proposed, it sets out how building on Kilmarnock's unique assets, the Council can act as a catalyst for widespread and lasting change by enabling coordinated investment and action across sectors and partners, and at the same time, deliver key improvements within its gift to serve the community. Members have had the opportunity to engage deeply in the development of the vision strategy and its action plan, and you will see um, throughout the document how your views have shaped the report and recommendations brought to Council today that, if approved, will mean really positive change and significant investment for the people we serve. The report simultaneously provides the overarching framework for delivery and change in Kilmarnock and brings forward proposals to achieve early success, with two subsequent papers on the Galleon Centre and the future of the multi-storey site also being presented today to provide further detail on key interventions in the first phase of delivery. Paragraphs 3 to 20 set out the background, starting with the macro environment surrounding Kilmarnock's regeneration, such as the economic environment, growth of online retail, that over time and accelerated by the pandemic um, have resulted in fundamental change to the way we use our towns and town centres. Within this, paragraphs 7 to 12 describe intervention that the Council and the Kilmarnock community have in previous years delivered to contribute to the town's regeneration. I'd highlight um, at paragraphs 8 and 9, Council's approval of the Kilmarnock Town Centre and South Central Kilmarnock Development Framework in March of this year. And within that, I would highlight the significant constraint on development in the south of the town due to the threat of flooding that has long um, added further complexity to the challenges in the town. Positively, members, the revised draft NPF4 published last month um, has the potential, if approved, to soften the national policy position and to be a significant step forward from the moratorium on development that is currently in place. Paragraphs 10 to 20 set out in detail the role of the development framework in pulling together previous and extant plans for Kilmarnock into an holistic evidence base and extensive suite um, of ambitious possible interventions that underpin this strategy. The five Kilmarnock strategic priorities identified from our um, place-based strategic planning conversations with corporate management team and members are set out at paragraph 24, attracting people into the town, supporting local businesses to thrive and grow, protecting and improving health and well-being, improving accessibility in and around the town and promoting active travel and greening of the area's economy. Through these sessions, we also had the opportunity for open discussion and heard a number of ideas for change, ranging from things that make a small but important difference in the short term to longer term strategic interventions that have the potential to be transformative in terms of the town's future. And essentially, this discussion mirrors the reality and complexity of planning for and creating change at a place level. There's huge passion and ambition for the town and a myriad of ideas and potential actions. 
One of the things I set out at paragraph 26 that this strategic vision sets out to do is call out the need to balance these through collective prioritisation so that we deliver the things that are most important for Comarnock as a whole and which, by extension, are most important to all of East Ayrshire. At paragraph 27, the vision contains, as you would expect, policy consideration and a strategic needs assessment for the town. But members, the vision goes far beyond and is based on much more than statistics representing need. It's predicated on the things that make Comarnock uniquely itself. Its history as a place and a people, particularly sons and daughters who have played an important role on the local, national and international stage. And how these combine to create a culture of which the fabric is innovation, creation and adapting to change vital assets to meet the challenges we face today. The strategy is not only steeped in the past and present, it looks to the future to understand what our vision should be, a future that will look very different from life as we know it today. This is the context for our vision as set out paragraph 29 um, of a thriving Comarnock, um, which I, I won't read out, but which determines the outcomes that we want to achieve in the long term, um, which are set out at the bullets at paragraph 30. In paragraphs 31 and 32, the report describes the strategic approach that we will take, if approved, to collectively change and grow towards our vision, taking into account the financial and operational imperatives, which is around joined up, joined up delivery based on consensus, focusing on key proactive interventions that are in our gift and consciously creating flexibility in what we do that can be built on over time. Members, I'm now going to hand over to Karen uh, to take you through the remainder of the paper. Thanks, Claire. So, members, as indicated in paragraph 34, the Kilmarnock Vision proposes to establish a new Kilmarnock strategic group, which will invite representation of key stakeholders, including but not limited to the Council's elected members and officers, Celebrate Kilmarnock, a Kilmarnock Business Association, Centre Stage, East Ayrshire Leisure Trust and members of the wider Kilmarnock community. It's clear as discussed, to implement change and guide the group initially, we've produced an integrating action plan. And the purpose of this is not to produce another list of all of our commitments or to set out the extent of our ambitions or possibilities in Kilmarnock, like opening up the river or creating stronger east-west connections across Sturrock Street and beyond. We have this in the Kilmarnock development framework. It is instead intended to bridge and bring together these existing and potential commitments and provide the route map to prioritising actions that are right for the town now and in the future and that are deliverable within the resources available. It's quite deliberately focused on the short term to allow the Kilmarnock Strategic Group to be convened. It's important that rather than trying to determine the best actions in isolation, that we do this as a group so we are collaboratively making decisions and delivering them in a joined up way. Although the action plan is short term, it is itself ambitious and commits to a series of early actions, key deliverables and strategic developments and enablers, enablers which will drive forwards transformational change. So just looking at a couple of examples of this, paragraph 36 refers um, to that some of these actions utilise funds from developer contributions which are related to the 2010 local plan. And today, a total of just under £272,000 of contributions has been collected from developments under that plan in relation to and tied to the Comarnock Town Centre strategy project. Paragraph 40 sets out that it's proposed that £200,000 of this is given as a balance to the Comarnock Strategic Group to allow a resource to enable early actions to be achieved. As per paragraphs 37 to 38, um, it's proposed that the remaining balance go to the site of the floral clock at the top of John Finney Street. In discussion between officers, elected members and partners towards the proposed solution has been undertaken. The balance will be used to consider options and implement a new solution for the site. As per paragraph 41, a third and significant early action is proposed for the building at the corner of Strand Street and Dunlop Street. A scheme is proposed to stabilise and maintain the facade and historic interest of the building 
and it's proposed that the front facade is retained and the remainder of the building will be lowered to Solom level, creating an enclosed garden for use by the workforce and tenants of the Ingram Enterprise Centre, Johnny Walker Bond and Opera House. Members, you will hear two further papers today which contain proposals for two further key deliverables, the refurbishment and repurposing of the galleon and proposals for the use of the multi-storey car park site upon its clearance. Paragraph 43 touches on the council's accommodation across the town and it needs to be used differently to recognise, to reflect, sorry, how more people are working from home while recognising the value of space where we can come together, collaborate and engage. Further proposals will be brought forward to rationalise office accommodation and investigate alternative uses for our building that contribute to Kilmarnock's strategic priorities where these are within the town. And the final thing I'm going to pick out is that work will continue with the key agencies group with a view to identifying solutions that may allow for redevelopment in South Central Kilmarnock so that we can look towards um, redevelopment in Local Development Plan 3. Moving on to governance, deliverability and accountability. The remit of the Kilmarnock Strategic Group at inception will be analysis and prioritisation of actions and oversight of completion of the early successes. Per paragraph 48, Council is invited to nominate four members to sit on the Strategic Group from within the four Kilmarnock multi-member wards. Within the Council, corporate management team, under the leadership of the Chief Executive, will have collective responsibility for management of delivery of Council actions and work streams for a strategic cohesion within the Strategic Group. Within the delivery arrangements, roles and responsibilities will be clearly defined and progress, resources, risks and timescales will be kept under regular review as set out in paragraphs 50 and 51. Members, there are 14 recommendations set out in paragraph 2 of this report. Members, this paper is, is really about action. Um, with these recommendations, we can implement a series of actions which will achieve really positive outcomes for the people that we serve. And we're happy to take any questions. But thank you, Provost. Thanks, Karen. Claire, uh, members going to open it up for questions. Leader. Thanks. Just it's maybe just to comment first of all, uh, some questions to follow. Just in the broad uh, the paper, I think you know comments there. You know doesn't should extend to our uh, ambition. That's quite right. It's a it's a plan of action. It's to get you know bringing some of the, the thoughts from the various groups. have got a an interest in, and then we named them all. There's quite a number of groups within Kilmarnock Town Centre, not just ourselves, but others that are, you know, it's be good to get them all involved with the decision making process. You know, one of the things that you know, we've criticised in the past in terms of opportunities to get place making funding, there's no, you know, there's, uh, there's a lack of coherence in terms of, you know, uh, being able to attract that funding, we get the group, the views of you know the, the whole community. You know, come out to itself just as a stop. I line around the town centre. It's around this town centre, and particularly the, the communities, uh, the suburbs round about, and and come on, the communities round about come on. Uh, and uh, hopefully it'll be. We, we need to bring everything together so that we're pointing in the, the right direction, and that we can take some early actions that we spoke about. Uh, spoke about there, and it's, it's, it's described there as a good. Uh, that we have the key groups and that uh, we have a, re a route map forward. Um, in terms of some of the, the short-term games or gains, I think you know the the multi-storey site, the floral clock, the Long Street, and our, even our own accommodation are some of the things that we really need to you know uh, get some early action on and just demonstrate to the, the people out there that we are, uh, you know. Things are evolving. There's some, uh, you know, and that we, we put our spend our resources wisely, uh, and you know, get the, the most benefit for the towns. I mean, one of the things we, we hosted the town, uh, town Scottish Town Partnership Conference, just to hear just how town centres right across Scotland are changing. You know, and the way you know, the way we need to develop, and a lot of some great ideas came out of that conference. And it'd be good to kind of get an early action to implement some of the suggestions about how we approve the, you know, the, the green environment, particularly, particularly with some other projects that are going as well. You know, in the the uh, the Infinity Loop and other things are are, are programmed that will affect the town centre as well. In particular, I think a wee bit of focus on the uh, the good news in terms of a wee bit more flexibility in terms of NPF. For and the the policy and, and flooding because you know to end that kind of moratorium and develop right up the command of water as something we need to do as a matter of, you know so if there's any flexibility there whatsoever we, we, we should you know be able to 
think about that, how we push these boundaries and get other get other forms of investment in, whether that's ourselves or the private sector. And uh, basically, that's all I've said at the moment, but I just think in terms of, it'd be good to get, you know, as we say in the recommendations, uh, participation from everyone, all the political groups and, and some way representatives of the Kilmarnock community. And well, that, I would, in terms of the proposals and uh, in terms of the group, rather than four elected members, could I suggest we have five and make it two, one, 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 so as we've got all the uh, all the political uh, parties are, and, and groups are, rec uh, are representative and uh, obviously ourselves as administration. So that's my main point just now, but I'm sure members have got a lot to say, but just like to thank uh, uh, the car, uh, the officers for their, car, uh, for their, for their, for clearing, Karen, sorry, uh, for their work. Yep, thanks for that. Members, any further? Uh, yep, I've got Councillor Douglas and then Councillor Boyd, um, Councillor McFadgen. Uh, members, we've got to, there's a whole load of recommendations there, but two of the main ones is agree to establish that strategic working group. Uh, the, uh, the leader has outlined uh, his wish for that and it's to agree uh, to elect the members onto it. So please bear that in mind. So we'll bring in Councillor Douglas first. Thank you, Provost, and thank you for the report. Um, I am particularly pleased to see uh, a bit of a softening in the stance of NPF4. Um, we know that SIPA have really uh, hamstrung us, uh, not just in Kilmarnock, but we know in Cumnock, New Cumnock, and the Irvine Valley um, have been particularly hamstrung by uh, some of their uh, positions that they have taken to date. So I do welcome that because we cannot leave uh, particularly vast swathes of Kilmarnock as a wasteland if we were left uh, with the, the stance that SEPA have taken to date, particularly in South Central Kilmarnock. So I do welcome that. Um, on In relation to the clock uh, at Kilmarnock Station, I mean, uh, I just uh, and I noticed that there's obviously been uh, a proposal here in relation to uh, nearly £72,000 to be proposed um, to you know, look again at, at the clock. But can I maybe ask, and that information is available, if David McDowell is maybe available, one of his team, just to give us uh, maybe some idea of, of what's been spent to date on the clock, first installing it and then any maintenance that has gone on for the clock that's rarely worked over the last number of years. And in relation to uh, the membership of, of that strategic group, certainly would welcome as broad uh, a representation as possible from elected members uh, in the command awards. Thanks. OK, any answer for the relation to the clock? If we can't get that information just now, Barry, we'll get it out to members uh, at a later date if we can't get that just now. Yeah, I can. Excuse me, uh, Provost. I can provide a summary of that, and I can I'll provide it to all members. Thanks. Yeah, David's going to provide that to all members, Barry, as soon as possible. That, thanks, Provost. Certainly, if it's information that's to hand, if it's something you do have, David, or if you know, um, even a, a headline would be useful. I think to know what we've spent so far, given what's been proposed to spend. But now we'll we'll get David. David will get that to all members as soon as possible. We'll get the, the, the details for that. Um, is that what was the other point? There was another point. Oh, I, I was just about the uh, as broad as possible, right? Okay, we'll get that down. Okay, uh, Councillor Boyd. Thanks, Provost. Um, two points here. First one, are we actually appointing the elected members, the five elected members in this session or later on? That's just my first point. Uh, if I get an answer to that, please, then I want to happen later, yeah. OK, thanks. Right, um, to follow on early actions, page 153, the command up floor o'clock. Just a few points and questions on it. The paper, to me, is a wee bit thin in detail. I've carried out my own research. Cabinet approved this clock in 2009 with a cost of £313,000. A projected maintenance of £15,000 a year, but £7,500 was agreed. It looked great at first but it was soon blighted by problems. 2016, and the maintenance budget was removed as a saving. So I've got three questions, please. 
One, why did the clock get installed without ensuring ease of maintenance and supply of parts? Secondly, for a significant investment, why it was a, never su a sufficient maintenance funding? Thirdly, a few years after installation, it was fronted with dead conifers. Why did it take years for these dead conifers to be removed? And there's still actually one there. Sorry, when I get the answers, I would like to come back in, please, on this point. Thanks. No, that's fine. Uh, raising that here, um, did you ask these questions previous to this meeting? And you got the answers? I've um, asked these questions, yeah, but I want to lead on to another part, yeah, so I'll, I'll lead on to another part just now then, okay? Who's going to re reply to this? Thanks, David. Robert. Uh, yeah, I've provided uh, Council Boyd with uh, an update in these matters, so I, I will be able to provide all other members with a kind of summary of the, the kind of key findings. But uh, the the why, I mean, my, my predecessor obviously took a decision uh, as part of budget cuts. So the the in terms of the the overall maintenance, uh, there was a number of areas that were were looked at to achieve uh, cuts at that particular time. That decision was. You know, taken. Um, obviously, uh, the the current position is that there is a a, a problem with maintenance on it, and we we've been looking at uh, opportunities, a whether we we should and and could be restoring it, or whether we we'll look at other options. And that's what uh, Karen has uh, suggested today. In terms of the the dead conifers, I can't give a kind of an overview of that. Why it hasn't been done before now? Uh, and and obviously, uh, at the time that the public realm works were carried out, uh, yeah, I think it was good practice to to obviously have some form of uh, you know maintenance regime in place. But I think over the time that that's been, as I mentioned before, it was cut. Yeah, no, there's nothing wrong with challenging the policy, Graham. Nothing at all. But if and this is for everybody, if there's questions you need to ask on specifics, please ask them before the meetings. Otherwise, we'll be here all day with folk asking questions. Absolutely right to challenge a policy decision. Nothing wrong with that. But if it's specific questions that could have been answered before, please uh, use that information before the meeting. But yeah, Graham, carry on. OK, I take your point there. And I don't think I'm taking too long to go through that. And I do think today the members need to know these facts. And I also could add, over the last nine years, 108,000 has been spent in futile attempts to sort it. That's £421,000 in a clock. It's barely worked. Now, I, I know in the paper the council can't fund regeneration itself. We need inward investment. The, the clock is a blight that, you know, it, how much is it actually going to take to sort it? I've looked at the paper, page 173, another nine months of debating and looking at this to and possibly throw even more money at this. So I'm going to move to make an amendment to the recommendation number nine in page 164. I would like to add to that, the clock will be removed with immediate effect and this site to be landscaped. So I might have to check with David Mitchell um, on how we go with this, but I would like the clock to be removed with immediate effect and landscape, and that's added to recommendation um, number nine. Thank you. Right, no, that's... Hold on, hold on. We need a, a, a seconder for that if you're putting a proposal over like that. I'm very happy to be that seconder, uh, Provost. Thank you. Councillor Mackay. So a proposal, a second. I'm going to ask David Mitchell for advice on this, and then we'll carry on. We call right, and I'm stand corrected. We've not had a move on a second of the recommendations yet. I think Councillor Reid indicated what his thinking was, so I don't think officially the recommendations have yet been moved. Is that accepted? Yeah. Right, in that case, what you have then is Councillor Rich, uh, Councillor Boyd. Sorry, just because you move, sorry, I'm getting distracted easily. Just uh, Councillor Boyd is therefore moved as a motion the recommendations, but with the change that the clock be removed. So at the moment, that's the motion before that's been moved as a motion. So it would require seconding, and then it's whether anyone is minded to move the recommendations in the form presented or any other form. And if we're more than one motion and two amendments. More than a motion and two amendments, then the standing orders provide for how we would deal with multiple amendments if that's the outcome. But at the moment, in terms of standing orders, 
the first yeah. motion moved is Councillor Boyd, so that is the motion. And the next question, as you rightly said, Provost, is, is there a seconder for that, which was Councillor Mackay? Right, um, I'm going to ask some more uh, advice, uh, uh, officers, and then we'll get back to the business proper. That's why we had to get it absolutely clear, Graham, about what's being proposed and seconded. David. Through, through you, Provost, I, I would just, I would highlight uh, the paragraph in the report, paragraph 38, that does actually make that as one of the kind of items of for the strategic group to consider. Uh, repair of the clock is one option, uh, removal of the clock is another, and replacing the landscaping is, as as uh, Councillor Boyce alluded to. Uh, and obviously uh, another option is removal of the clock and installation of public art. That's, I mean, that's a very vague, a uh, very summarised uh, option appraisal, but the reality is the what we were wanting to do today was to bring this to members to as part of the strategic position and look at that as one element of it. And uh, and obviously it's up to members to consider how they want to do that forward. Yeah, there was options there, Graham. That's why I was. Yeah, no, it's okay. There was options there, and that's why we need to get absolutely clear the order of business in the way so we're doing it properly. I'll bring you back in in a minute, leader. I've got every sympathy for what Graham's proposing here, but, uh, you know, as David says there, you know, this is a matter for the group to consider. And I think, you know, it should be, you know, if we want to change the, the formal words of the, 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 the recommendations here, that, you know, one of the first actions that the group take is to look at uh, the floral court, because I know that already we've been on site looking at that. So we don't really know uh, how much this is going to cost. And uh, if it exceeds this envelope, the money is going to come from somewhere else, some of our other community projects. You know, as we've seen, you know, uh, kind of whole scale changes to this can run, uh, run into substantial sums of money. And, you know, we don't know where that money is going to come from. It could affect our local budgets. But I agree with it in terms of the broad sympathy. We need to replace the, the clock. I don't know. One of the discussions that we had on site was to use the mechanism of the clock the uh, and use the electric, you know, to to to, br to bring an, an, an alternative, or whether you want to replace a, a clock with something else entirely. But I think you know, rather than have this discussion out here, I think it'd be a matter to you know remit the group with its first action to to look at the clock and the clock's uh, removal uh, as a matter of urgency. But you know, if we don't have a, an exact uh, uh, amount of money for this, uh, you know, it could. It could take away from some other projects. So I have a big kind of concern there. The other fact I just but maybe you know I don't recognise in terms of the and I, I think it would be fair to get a report for the people that are, are going to be, be making this decision. I, I'm not aware of the, the, the amount of money spent you know, that three hundred thousand pounds been that's been quoted. I don't know where that's from, what it was for. You know I don't I'm not sure if that was for the clock in its entirety because I know that considerable work was done to the the the, the banking. Uh, the whole thing, you know, which was the or ownership, it was a uh, network rail. And uh, for recollection, there was a whole lot of uh, Japanese knotweed and other. Uh, uh, the whole the whole of that banking was replaced at the time. It wasn't just a matter for that three hundred thousand pounds from memory that it was just devoted to that clock. So there's a lot of things that folk will have to consider. And I mean, and that's the dramatic headlines that folk are, you know, but I don't know, I can't remember from memory just in terms of specifically about the clock, how much it costs. But I think whoever's making this decision need to make an informed decision and one that's not going to have an impact on other projects across East Ayrshire. We've got any other members, Councillor McFadgen. Um, first of all, I would like to agree with Councillor Boyd. That clock that's there, it's laying at an angle on the ground, categorically has got to go. That is an engineering technical nightmare. I mean, if it's a mechanical clock trying to sweep round, the minute the snow or ice takes it, the gears are going to get stripped because the hands, hands are going to get jammed. If it's a fully electronic clock working on electronic segments moving about, there's a little finite life to how waterproof any I, IEP rated units in the ground are. So I would suggest, yes, that clock definitely goes. I think the wisdom of spending £79,000 on something like that in this day and age is mad. And I think, you know, if anything, that figure could be, that money could be, yes, ring fenced. But whatever goes there, I think, has to come back to us as a full council with a presentation and we look at it and we see it. Because, I mean, just from the point of view of trying to make the most of Kilmarnock. 
for a fraction of the cost, you could have a large silhouette of the front of a train engine, a steam engine, with a big clock in the middle of the boiler plate in the front. It could be multicolored, it could be illuminated, a big arch over the top of it, welcome to Kilmarnock. I don't think you could spend £20,000 having something like that made and erected. And it'd be much more poignant, it would point to the fact that that's a train station, we're welcoming people to Kilmarnock. Train building is the heritage here. Something much more effective and nicer looking in the landscaped ground, which would never probably break because it was waterproof, it was upright, would be much more appropriate, much cheaper. And I think that should be presented to all of us for us to say, yeah, we like this, we'd like that, we don't like that. And we can ring fence some money and hopefully we can fix the situation for 20 grand and have 50,000 pounds spare. So how that fits into this conversation. That, that will all come out, I'm sure, with the working group that I think folk have accepted there's going to be. So though that conversation can all go. Leader. The best I respect, I'm, you know, I'm not disagreeing at all, but I don't think we can suggest bring it, pluck it any figure out of thin air here in terms of 20 grand that's going to make it right. I'm quite sure 20 grand is not going to make it right. But I think always have a, a duty and a responsibility before we're committing ourselves to end, we need, we need to have this costed before we're agreeing it. Or you're, you're, you're going to be taking it away from someone else and maybe a bit appropriate legal advice. And I, no, I absolutely 100% agree with sympathy with what has been suggested. Not sure one sympathy the right word, probably, but I'll give it a go. Um, I think we just need to be clear in terms of process. As members can see, you have a report before you with 19 recommendations. In terms of the pro in terms of the report, the recommendation in terms of the treatment of the clock is that it, uh, the proposal is, as per the paper, that it be remitted to the group to be set up to deal with all matters, the commander strategic group pertaining to the delivery of the vision, and also to allocate the money that's left to that group on the basis that that group then would take forward decision making around the clock. The amendment that's been proposed to that particular recommendation is to effectively take that decision now here at Council and decide it comes out. So that would remove the need for the strategic group to consider it. However, I don't think Council's in a position today to then take that a stage further and start to deliberate now without the benefit of the necessary background information what the alternatives might be. The fact that it's starting to go that way might actually strengthen the argument it would be better for this to be considered by the strategic group with all the relevant information in front of them. However, that's a matter for Council. In terms of the process, we just need to be clear as well, we don't take individual recommendations, we take them on block. So I just need to be clear that Councillor Boyd has moved the effectively, are you moving all other recommendations with the amendment to recommendation five? And is that what Councillor Mackay seconding? Well, I, well I, I need to ask, item 38, paragraph 38 in the papers, the second bullet point is doing exactly what you're asking in your motion. So that can be considered with the recommendations that go to the working group. And that would come back to council for council to, to, to decide. But, but my, my point is, get away in. My point is, your motion, as I heard it right, and I might be wrong, that Council Mackay seconded was taking that part out, taking that whole. Uh, paragraph nine out that would have dealt with the issue because it would have come back to council for decision after all the information had been taken into account properly costed and everything rather than making a decision today but that's your choice you've made the, uh, a proposal for it council mckay seconded it so you're still happy with that that's that's where we need to be clear yep come in i had to come back in not um i'm sticking with this um well for years the clock's been a blight for absolute years we're going to be waiting another nine months for a public consultation. Everybody I speak to says it's it's in a terrible state. As far as I'm concerned, I want to move the motion. It's a, it's actually um, recommendation nine. Um, that what's there is fine. I just want to add in the part that the clock will be removed with immediate effect and the site be landscaped. It's pretty straightforward. That's what I want to propose, and it seems as if Councillor Mackay has seconded that. Or of his point order. 
uh, just just on the point that Dougie made, I mean, we don't actually own this land. <laughs> I think that's, that's, that's an important point. I mean, we can we can be making all these uh, demands today, you know, for whatever reason, but we need to get into the discussion with, with, with the owners of the land before we can strike a blow. So I think, you know, slow and steady wins the race. I know it's nine months, Graham, but I think it's more important we get the right decision rather than a quick decision. Don, hold on. I'm going to bring David in, guys. We need to bring this to a close. We'll be here all day. Bring David in for advice. I'll bring a, let another couple of folk in. Yeah, sorry, John. Yeah, uh, and, and we'll join you. Been in before. I've got a pile of folk here. David, as I said, Provis, the proposal in the paper would be effectively to leave the decision on the future of the clock to the strategic group. If I've missed it in the report, colleagues will tell me. But it doesn't at the moment suggest it would come back to council for final approval. So if Council wanted the final say, option one is agree what's in front of you, but amend it so that the final position of the group that they reach comes back to Council, so Council has the final say. The other option that has been put forward, and it is competent, probably, whether or not it's attractive to Council, it's as competent, is to remove, uh, to alter the recommendation nine, to take that decision away from the group. And what Councillor Boyd's motion or a motion is effectively inviting Council to do is to take that decision today, that the clock be removed. At the end of the day, the report clearly states that the site is leased till 2029. And if the decision were to remove it, then we would presumably have to maintain the lease because they're not going to let us out early. So we'd maintain the lease, landscape it, and then the lease would be terminated in, in seven years' time. So the question for either the council or the steering group is, what happens to that space for the next seven years if the clock comes out? Should a decision be taken, which doesn't seem likely from this conversation, that the clock remain, then we would need to negotiate the extension of the lease beyond 2029. So fundamentally, to keep us focused, as I know you're trying to do, Provost, the question for council is, are you happy by the majority, if it goes to the vote, to leave this to the steering group to consider Perhaps with the temperament, uh, the tempering of that, that it comes back to council for a final say. So the decision's taken here, or as proposed by Councillor Boyd, seconded by Councillor Mackay, by amending uh, recommendation nine. Sorry, uh, the effect of that would be to take this away for the steering group and council take the decision today. The clock's coming out, and officers would then go away and implement that action as the will of council. But I also need to be clear, as I said in process, before we get totally bogged down with the clock, Provost and members, that we need to be clear that Councillor Boyd, our Councillor Boyd and Councillor Mackay, given theirs is the motion, moving all other 18 recommendations as they are and only proposing this change to this one, because we need that clarity, because we can't just deal with one amendment to one recommendation. We never have, and that's not what standing orders allow for. So I just need Councillor Boyd and Councillor Mackay to be clear what they're moving, and I need to be clear as I can with Council that there is an option to be a choice to be made. Put it to the steering group per the paper or take the decision today per the motion and it's for Council to decide. Right, thanks for that, Leader, and then we'll carry on with the discussion. Just well, just a point of order, just uh, uh, to Graham, just as accepting my suggestion and uh, recommendation six that we, the group be two one 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 for the five uh, members. Well, well, that that's that for, that will form part of the proposal because David's already asked that. Yeah. Now, uh, Councillor Richardson. Thanks, Provost. Um, I mean, like most people in Comal and probably everybody in this uh, chamber, I actually share the frustration of uh, Councillor Boyd, Councillor Mackay, Councillor McFadgen, and most other people that have spoken already about the clock because. As you know, command is one way system. You're driving up John Finney Street, and that's a very that's a, a quite an important uh, small plot of land because as you're driving up John Finney Street, it's an uphill uh, gradient, and you can't help but see the clock. And you're driving up John Finney Street, thing that clock's not working again. So everybody's frustrated about the clock, but I mean, it's got so many potential purposes. I mean, I'm thinking about the chat we had this morning, Councillor McFadgen. How do we advertise the Grand Hall? Well, think about all the traffic that's going up John Finney Street. What a place to put something that advertises what's on at the Grand Hall in that plot of land. But this should all be discussed. That's just my thoughts, Councillor McCann. Hey, Councillor McFadgen, sorry. This should all be discussed at the working group. That's why it's important that. that we get we get we get all these views at the working group and then decide what to do with the land. Thank you. Councillor Cowan. Thank you, Provost. Um, 
points that I was going to make about the clock have been made by, by others. So just to summarise, I would find it difficult to support the decision today to remove the clock without having that detailed knowledge and some of the examples that have been given, that some of the alternatives that could be put in that place. I think the right place to make that decision with that detailed knowledge is with the, the working group. Um, moving on, however, I would like to thank uh, Karen and Claire for the paper. I think it's a, a good indication today that there's been that collaboration between the two different uh, departments. So getting away from previous silo working, we've now got planning, economic development and vibrant communities working together. This paper gives us the opportunity to raise the bar. It really needs to be about the art of possibility of what we can do in the town. And this, hopefully this paper will give us that opportunity to move forward and produce some of the similar results that we saw recently with the East Yorkshire Leisure Trust um, improvements. We also need to take the community with us on this. And by that, I don't mean extensive um, consultations and engagements because we've got a lot of that knowledge. We need the right narratives in the town and we need to be listening to people and giving people the opportunity to get involved. And hopefully that's what this paper can do. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor George McGee. Hi, thanks, Provost. And I uh, appreciate the time uh, again to uh, myself and other councillors last night, uh, by Karen and uh, Claire, and we had a good discussion on the clock, and I'm happy enough to support Councillor Boyd today. However, in the discussion, I think it is clear that Given the leader of the council's suggestion that it's going to be two, one, one and one, that working group, and I would presume, eh, maybe I shouldn't presume, but I would say Councillor Boyd might well be the independent member that would be on that working group. Eh, and so there would be a big say for the eh, that working group and what's going to be happening. And I think it's clear that I mean, I think the, the, the cloak's been a blight for a time, but it's not just the cloak at that area. If I go back to 2003, when we had the Development Services Committee and the money we spent, compulsory purchases and buildings all the way up, June Finney Street, and yet you get to the top corner and there's still trees growing out eh, the top of the buildings. And then you've got the building to eh, your left hand side that's been sitting derelict for a long period of time, and the GPO building that's been derelict, although I believe there is some interest in it at this time. So I think uh, having the working group looking at this, weigh all the information, and Councillor Boyd's quite rightly asked the questions, how much have we spent in the cloak, how much to maintain it? My question would be, how do we landscape it and maintain it after that? Because we can't even get the grass cut in the slopes in our parks. Uh, unless you're at Bunnett and the railway station, that slope gets cut. Uh, but, I mean, uh, how do you uh, maintain that uh, safely? Because it's, on a, again, it's not a good angle. So there are questions that, that I've got, and I think can, I'm very supportive of removing the cloak altogether, because I think it's a blight. However, I think, again, the working group, and listening to all that's been said here, that... Maybe the working group should be allowed to go forward and take the decisions. And I think that would be based on all the correct information. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Douglas. Thank you, Provost. Um, and thank you for allowing me back in. I know, first of all, that uh, Councillor Boyd raised and uh, mentioned particular figures around the cost of the clock. And I think just going back to the question I'd asked, if that information is available, it would be important, I think, to have that information before we take a decision. Now, um, I don't want to really spend any more money on a clock that has rarely worked. And I don't really want to personally kick this clock down the road or kick it into the long grass for a decision in nine months. I think the working group absolutely is required. And there are other important things to, to look at here. And we know Certainly, the facade of one to uh, one Strand Street, twelve and Lot Street, absolutely vital and has been a blight as well. And good that that can be considered as part of this working group. But I note there are options for the clock. The clock hasn't worked for a long time. Has clearly, given what Graham Boyd has just said, caused a considerable amount of money. And we're then talking about another seventy-two thousand pounds 
to look at the clock further, I, you know, I'm happy to support Graham's uh, motion here that we remove the clock. But if there are figures that's available, and Graham has mentioned specific figures, if they're available, I don't see why officers can't just let us all have that now. Leader. Thanks, Prop. I don't think there's much division in here other than, I mean, I want the clock out. I would, that's my preferred choice. I think everybody in Kilmarnock would want that clock out. But I think, you know, as Barry says, the quantum that was talked about installing, it was 320,000. If the quantum in terms of, and we, this is not no even our ground, you can imagine, you know, this is sometime in the future and inflation's happening and the rest of it. But if the quantum's anywhere near that £300,000 that we're spending, that's serious, serious money we've got to find in terms of capital. And it's a big, huge commitment to maintain that area because we'd, presumably we'd have to get into some kind of negotiation with Network Rail or whoever has owns the site. It's just to err in caution, just in case we're not commit ourselves and we're not letting Network Rail get rid of it, you know, sharpen their pencil and, you know, you know, there's a bill at the end of the council that's going to affect other projects. As all I'm saying, you know, you know, some report it back to the next council for its first meeting or whatever, anything, but we need, they need this thing, as Barry says, I, I totally agree, we need it properly costed and have some kind of, even a broad brush figure of much what we're actually committing the council to in financial terms, because just now, Right now, as we're coming to the budget, we'll need every penny. Okay, thank you. Councillor Mackay. Thank you very much, Provost, for letting me back in. I am uh, maintaining the position if we are in a situation where we have to accept as a whole with the amendment to uh, paragraph five that the strategic group is set up at 2111. I am absolutely happy to accept, to second the motion, therefore, that has been put forward. And my view is incredibly simple. It was council who determined this matter. We are having the opportunity today to take a position on it. I think people are expressing positions on it. I think, therefore, that we deal with this matter today, that is before us now, and Council takes this decision right now. I really don't want to pursue but, but, this yeah, further that's your, on. That's yeah, absolutely that's the position that we are now at. Yeah, you've, you've made that clear, Maureen, and you've seconded it. So we're at the position, folks. There's no more discussion on here. We're moving to uh, David. Yeah, OK. I think just to try and keep this as simple as possible, Councillor Reid had indicated the intention to move uh, not the four members in recommendation six per the paper, but to broaden that to five. And the proposal there is two from the SNP, one from Labour, one from Conservative and an Independent. Apologies, Councillor Reid, I can't recall if you it specifically moved it be Councillor Boyd or if you're happy to leave it to the independents and individuals to, to leave that amongst themselves. But that, that I think there's general agreement for that. So if, if, if everyone in the room and on screen is able to confirm acceptance of that, then we can keep things simple. Thereafter, as we said, the paper suggested remit the matter to the steering group and let them consider the options specified in 38, which were repair, removal and replacement with landscaping or removal and installation of something else. The report rightly reflects that whatever that other something else is, the current lease is up in 2029 and any lease operates on the basis that when the lease comes to an end, the tenant is required to reinstate the ground. So even if the clock is removed, we will need to return that land to Network Rail in 2029 in much the same condition as it was taken. So it's going to cost a little bit more, whatever you do. So the paper suggests leave it to the steering group part of council today is indicating an, an, a preference to deal with it here at council and that's the effect of the motion, the motion uh, from councillor Boyd seconded by councillor Mackay which I'm assuming incorporates the amendment to recommendation six but seeks to amend recommendation nine not to agree the allocation uh, and not to remit it to the centre strategy group uh, to take the decision but in fact the effect as you've all heard is that council has been invited to take the decision today that the clock be removed. 
So at the moment, there is a motion to that effect, seconded. I've, as I've said again, I've still not a complete confirmation, but I'm hoping that it is the case that everything else is OK in relation to the mover and seconder. And we have that clarity because it's the members that need to be clear what they've been asked to, to, to vote for. And if it is the case that what you have is Councillor Boyd, Secretary Councillor Mackay, moving the recommendations with the agreed change to number six and the proposed change to number nine, then it's simply a question of whether anyone is otherwise minded and we wish to move uh, an amendment and from the discussion the obvious amendment might just be to go with the recommendations provost apologies but no let's, we've had enough discussion guys there's been enough discussion plenty of discussion we need to get to uh, an end here and there's a, a motion seconded Ad right clarification what's the clarification if we go with councillor boyd's proposal does that simply mean that this clock that's there is gone, that's it, but the working group can then look at the ground and look at what's carry on with what they would do? Is Councillor Boyd's motion simply about removing this clock and but doesn't pre doesn't prevent anything else? That's just exactly what I was going to say, Joy. Right. So we're absolutely... Graham. I know you're getting frustrated. Just to make it quite clear, I'm proposing the motion and... Um, Councillor Reid's point about the 2111, I'm perfectly happy with that, and having David spelled out is perfectly fine. So I'm proposing the motion. That's what I want to say. I'm not discussing it any further because I'm that's what I was, and, that, and that's what I was going to explain mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, I'm just want to move this yeah. on as well. Yeah. Right. I promise. I'll just go back to the other remarks. If Council takes a decision today to remove that clock, then in terms of best value and anything else, there would be no point to extending the lease beyond 2029. I'm not saying Council will, but that's the motion at the moment. If Council takes a decision, it's not about long-term alternatives, Councillor McFadgen, because the lease should be relinquished in 2029. So it's what do we do with the ground for the remaining seven years, six years at this rate, of the lease. And I'll leave it at that, Probably just to be helpful. Uh, just, and for clarification, the independent would be the only independent commander, which would be Councillor Boyd. Uh, but if, if even if the council we could go to the ask the group to make the final decision, but the council's preferred option is removal. If the council's preferred option is removal, but tasks the 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 working group to come up for proposals. But they might come back and just say that, you know, that it's like economically no possible to do that. So, but just it, it states, it reinforces what we're all saying around the clock. We won't want it, but we know why, you know, we might run into undue costs and undue commitments that I'm a wee bit worried about. So, through you, Rob, in terms of the respond to that, the, that's a matter for you if you wish to move it, Councillor Reid. Uh, others may take the view within or without the chamber that to ask the steering group to take a decision that's already been taken for them is kind of pointless. And then one wonders what the impact is in the steering group, given everything else we're asking them to do. I'm just saying that's a relevant consideration. If you take the decision, it begs the question, what have they been asked then to consider? And what I'm actively trying to promote is they're not asked to consider and come up with plans for the remaining seven years of that site. If the clock comes out, then folks should plan on the basis the site will return to network rail in seven years. Right. The pro proposal and the seconded uh, uh, part of this accepts everything else that's on there, including the recognition that it's going to be 2111. That's a proposal and seconder, so we need to go to the vote. Are there any other amendments? Councillor Maitland. Will this be going to a roll call, Provost? Somebody still would need to move. At the moment, there's only a motion, so there needs to be some amendment, Provost I. So I'm, I'm the amendment. <laughs> right, so uh, I'm just amending that we, we change the, 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 the five elected members, two, one, and one, and one, uh, one from uh, Labour, one from Conserve, two for the SNP, and the independent member be Councillor Boyd. And that in terms of the, the clock, we've we, we move that uh, the, the group consider that. That's, to, can you, you earlier have indicated perhaps as an alternative approach, the group consider it, but it come back to council for a final decision. Are you including that or not for absolute clarity? And I'm not buying or selling there, Councillor Let the group, a little bit enough. 
spoke for the council there to tell them what the council's view is. Right, folks, absolutely clear. We've got an end point now. Councillor McGee, point of order. Uh, again, we have spent a lot of time. Maybe this isn't a point of order. I'm quite sure David will keep me clear on that. However, getting the discussion and the fact that we don't ken how much it's going to cost to remove the clock, is the motion competent? That, that's what I want to make because I think the broad agreement in here as we've heard for the discussion is that we do want to remove the clock, <laughs> but we're but we're want to get to the working group that we've made three, two, one, one and one. So I'm asking, is is that a competent motion? Because we don't care what the cost is, and that's something that should be pretty difficult for uh, elected members to make up a, a motion that we don't care what the actual cost is, and we can with budgets and financial heavens read. The heat of finance can through the day. Thank you. I think that one goes more to the wisdom of the proposal rather than the competence, because as I say again, the the legal position is we lease that site till 2029. So whether we know the cost or not, we're either renewing the lease in 29 or we're uh, removing the clock regardless of the cost. Uh, I take your point, Councillor McGee, but the paper clearly sets out the rationale was to allow the steering group to consider all of this. And this, I wouldn't say despite building on the debate that's taking place this morning, it's quite clear there is a will, at least among some of the members, to invite Council taking the decision today. I don't know what information officers have in removal of the cost, but one would not expect to be anything like what seems to be the cost for installing it. No, no, a fair point. Right, we've got a motion. I'd, I'd just like to back up Councillor McGee because, you know, when I became a politician, uh, one of the things that I promised myself was that I'd look after uh, taxpayers' money, council taxpayers' money. Um, how can we vote on something the day that we don't know what the cost of it is going to be? That's like writing a blank cheque. It's just... I'd, I just can't understand how we can do that. I have some last point. I'd maybe like to call my uh, section, but the finance officer, you know, just to explain the mechanics, particularly for the new members, because I've never known in my lifetime here in terms of voting for somebody that I didn't know the, the, the cost was, what the implications, if it hits a quantum or some kind of commitment in the future, like 300,000, 500,000 pounds, where that money would come from? Joe? Thank you, Provost, and through you. Um, so the, the paper makes clear that there's, that there's an envelope of developer contributions of about £272,000. The plan here is to use £72,000 of that then use the remainder for other projects. You've touched on it yourself, Leader, in that if this was to go over budget, then it would be less money for the available other projects. So there's the developer's contributions. If it goes higher than that, then it would need to come back for, for a source of funding. Um, that source of funding is, is, is unknown at this point in time. But in terms of moving forward, um, it is unusual um, to um, go ahead with a, with a, with a proposal that is, unfund, that is uncosted. Um, but um, noting that there's the developer contributions, noting that the, the, the recommendation or the paragraph up to eight says that it is recommended that £72,000 is allocated in principle, um, then um, you know, it would be taken forward through facilities and forward to manage to bring back a range of options. They would need to be at some point in the process, uh, something remitted back to cabinet or indeed council that would give an indication of the latest price in terms of the, the quotes coming back in to take that removal uh, of the of the clock. So just be clear, I mean, this could affect some of the projects listed that are desirables, what we want to do with the multi-storey car park when it's done, and all these other, that even contained within this report and beyond. We don't know this. It's, I just, I agree with the general principle, but I just, I, 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 I couldn't support something that's uncosted. Right. Thank you. Thanks for that advice, folks. A point of order. Um, we've got the motion. We've got a second there. Uh, are there any other amendments? The, the recommendations as laid down, uh, and with you know, uh, just recommendation with two yep. one one one. I think everybody understands that. Do you have a seconder? Yep. Right. It was a Jim McMahon. 
Right, folks, we're going to go to the vote. By, as was confirmed, Provis, uh, no, I'm clarifying the vote and moving to the vote, Provis, sorry. Uh, it will be roll call because we have some members on teams. To be absolutely clear, the motion is that moved by Councillor Boyd and seconded by Councillor McCann, which is the recommendations on page 146, including the agreed amendment by all to recommendation six, that the composition be five members, and you're clear in that but with the amendment to recommendation nine as per the report that the council simply decide today that the clock is to be removed within the budget of just under £72,000 allocated, noting that if that's not enough, it would come back to, to council uh, in terms of the funding aspect. That's the motion. The amendment from Councillor Reid is the same in terms of the change to recommendation six, but otherwise as per the recommendations in the report, second by Councillor McMahon. So that's the motion and the amendment, and over to Julie to to initiate the roll call vote, Provost. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks very much, Provost. Um, as David has says, the motion was by Councillor Boyd and the amendment is by Councillor Reid. Provost Jim Todd. Amendment. Councillor Stephen Canning. Amendment. Councillor Ellen Friel. Motion. Councillor John McFadgen. Councillor John McGee. Councillor Elaine Cowan. Amendment. Councillor Maudie Mackay. Motion. Councillor David Richardson. Amendment. Councillor James Adams. Councillor Lillian Jones. Motion. Councillor Ian Linton. Councillor Douglas Reid. Councillor Graham Barton. Amendment. Councillor Graham Boyd. Motion. Councillor Barry Douglas. Motion. Councillor Neil Ingram. Amendment. Councillor Peter Mabin. For the motion. Councillor Claire Maitland. Amendment. Councillor Sally Cogley. Motion. Councillor Kevin McGregor. Motion. Councillor Linda Holland. Oh, motion, thank you. Thank you. Deputy Provost Claire Leach. Councillor William Lennox. Amendment, please. Councillor Alison Simmons. Motion. Councillor Billy Crawford. Motion. Councillor June Kyle. Motion. Councillor Jim McMahon. Amendment, please. Councillor Neil Watts. Motion. Councillor Drew Filson. Councillor Jennifer Hogg. And Councillor Elaine Stewart. Thank you, Provost. The um, vote is 16 for the motion, 15 for the amendment. Right, thanks, Julie. Right, members, we're going on to item 8.2. This is the Galleon Centre, Kilmarnock, and Kevin's going to speak to this paper. Thank you, Provost, um, and, and to you. Um, and with your leave, um, I will share this report alongside um, Simon Bell. Um, Members, uh, the people before you today, which I know a number of you have uh, had broad engagement on, um, is a positive opportunity that aims to support the Council's recognition or regeneration ambitions and invest in our leisure facilities for our residents. The report aims to, in paragraph one, give an update on the progress of the galleon and seek permission to uh, recommence um, the proposed refurbishment project and agree to appoint a design team to take the project to Reba stage two, which is the concept design. Members, in terms of paragraphs three to ten, gives a background to the galleon, which came into being in 1987, being a leader in its field at the time, um, and has served East Ayrshire um, extremely well over the years. Paragraphs 11 to 15 outlines the impact that COVID has had on the galleon, including um, the, the requirement for the council to invest um, within the galleon, um, as well as set direction and conditions alongside that investment. Members, uh, in terms of paragraph 16 to 22, outlines the current position. And in update members, um, in terms of the progress that the galleon has made, 
It mentions the positive trajectory that the galleon is now on. Um, for example, the galleon's memberships are back to pre-pandemic levels. And it also talks about the arrangements that the galleon are taking forward in paragraph 17 in terms of its governance review, in terms of its future um, uh, direction as a, an organisation, potentially as a scale, and also potential reconsideration of their future relationship with East Ayrshire Leisure. Members, in terms of paragraphs um, 23 and 24, this outlines the trustees' preferred model um, of refurbishment based on extensive uh, community engagement. Um, but it does have to uh, state that it is in relation to the affordability um, and members' um, uh, acceptance and tolerance in terms of the project and the overall affordability to the council. Members, um, just at this point, I will hand over to Simon Bell, who will maybe go through some more of the technical elements within the report. Simon. Thanks, Kevin. Um, thank you, Provost. Uh, good afternoon, members. Um, so the cost estimates for the project are detailed at paragraphs 25 to 28, and it notes that due to current market volatility, prediction of future construction inflation is extremely challenging. It's also noted that the current cost estimates are uh, based on preliminary feasibility layouts, and that's using high level square metre rates. And, and as such, there's a significant risk that actual costs could be higher than estimated. We've now carried out a review of the anticipated programme timescales, and it's expected that the earliest um, start on site date if the project was to go ahead would be late in 2024. So using the, the current uh, BCIS projections to that time, the updated cost estimate noted at paragraph 25's um, 20.6 million pounds. It should be recognised, however, that the cost does not include allowances to fully address the Council's climate change ambitions. And to put that into some context, based on the experience from the St. Sophia's project, along with Scottish Futures Trust metrics um, that we have, it's estimated that a complete fit retrofit of the Galleon Centre could be in excess of £40 million. Pounds. It therefore be necessary to carry out further detailed technical assessment to establish the most cost effective level of NRFIT informed approach that would be appropriate for this building. And at this stage, it's not possible to ac accurately determine potential costs associated with improving energy performance. However, it is considered that the total cost estimate for the project could be between 20 and 25 million pounds. To allow assessment of the full project scope and more accurate cost estimates to be prepared, as Kevin's outlined, it's recommended that the project be developed to RIBA Stage 2 concept design using the services of a, a specialist external uh, consultant multidisciplinary design team. Paragraphs 29 to 33 provide information on the requirement for commodity strategies, including procurement of the design team, and it's estimated that costs associated with this commission could be approximately £400,000. And it's recommended that those are drawn down from the current capital allocation for the project. The com Commission would also include a review of work already undertaken, along with the development of a suite of proposed options for varying levels of financial investment. And development of the project to that RIBA stage two could take around about nine months to complete. Um, details of an action plan timeframe are set out at paragraphs 37. Paragraphs 34 to 36 provide a, a broader assessment of the project delivery uh, and timescales. It includes early consideration that we've given to potential phasing of refurbishment works. Um, that would allow areas of the facility to remain operational, which would be beneficial for, for the galleon, but would be challenging and would need um, further more detailed assessment. Timescales for the actual construction works, should the project proceed, are also difficult to determine at this stage, but we do anticipate it could be in the region of 24 months. Um, so that would be a potential completion of all phases by December uh, 2026. Uh, as noted in the financial implications, um, at paragraphs uh, 38 to 41, works underway to review the wider capital programme within the context of current financial pressures. An approval to develop this project to RIBA Stage 2 would provide time for the review to be completed and allow further consideration of the project in relation to wider strategic priorities. Members, the, the remainder of the implications are set out at paragraphs 42 to 45, with the recommendations at, at paragraph 2. Thank you, Provost. Happy to take any questions.
Thanks, Kevin. Simon, uh, I'll open it up. Folks, Councillor Linton. Thanks again, Provost. It's, it's a privilege to be the, the chair of the Galleon Trust for almost two years now, and I, I'd like to very much to take this uh, opportunity to publicly state my appreciation of the fantastic job that, that Steady Matthews is doing as, as uh, the centre's manager. It's been a very difficult time. Um, Kevin and, and Bob McCulloch, you know, set series of you know thresholds that had to be addressed for the council to continue a role in supporting the, the galleon. Steady has has, has easily matched those and, and you know it's it's quite remarkable that we're back up to the pre-pandemic levels of membership. I drove past the other day and there was a huge articulated lorry uh, making a delivery of new gym equipment which hopefully will go some way to to further increase those numbers. Uh, just on Simon's point about the energy efficiency of the building, I know again Steady under his own direction, has been looking at the possibility of covering the roof in solar panels. The only reason he hasn't gone ahead with that is because of the poor state of the, the existing roof. It would be, you know, he's, he's waiting to the decision comes in to refurbish the building, get the roof in. But work is already well underway to, to making the building electrically uh, self, self-sustaining. So, you know, I think we're in a good position here. And I think, you know, a lot of that is down to the hard work of the manager. Thank you. Councillor Douglas. Thank you, Provost. And again, Simon, thank you for the report. Um, I'm a former trustee of the Galleon uh, myself for a period um, and do absolutely recognise the, the good work that Sterry and his team are doing at the Galleon. And uh, like Councillor Linton had said, it is really encouraging to see that memberships uh, increasing, uh, whilst we know that isn't the case for many other organisations. Um, I think my point really is is more about the, the, the costs involved here. Um, I think just so I'm clear, are we, so we're proposing the £400,000 for the design team fees, and that is something that I take it will then be reported back because my concern is, could we spend that money to then ultimately find out that what is being proposed isn't sustainable and won't give us some longevity? I think I would also look for some clarity around what the likely lifespan of the galleon will be um, as a result of these proposals. Um, and we might not know quite that yet, but I think to get an indication of that would be helpful. And I think, Provost, really, it would be, uh, I think, important to say that if we are committing to that level of spend, um, that perhaps we could look at, you know, the, the trust moving into East Ayrshire Leisure um, as potentially a condition of, of that money being spent. Thanks. Yep, Joe. Any ind indicative? Uh, through you, Provost. Um, the, the, the report itself uh, asks for approval to spend the, the £400,000 in order to take it to that stage. I'm very conscious colleagues from housing and community are here, um, but that, that costing will come in almost like a menu system that will allow us to, to identify the various parts that make up those costs and will allow council the opportunity to review those costs and perhaps take out those costs that take above certain affordability lines. At the same time, and as noted in the report, um, Head of Housing and Communities and, and Kevin have been quite clear that as part of this process and recognised by Councillor Linton, that the trust themselves are looking at all options, including SCIO and other options. And as part of that, it would be normal business to, to, to have both sets of trustees within the Galleon and within East Asia Leisure Trust to have discussions about what that means going forward. We are very conscious that in the part as a council, that when that was costed, there were issues around the affordable, affordability of, of that potential. And I emphasise the word potential merger. However, uh, it's an exercise that perhaps it's time to look at again um, without making any any promises and see what the figure comes out at. It's something that's in the report and, you know, the Head of Housing and Communities has instructed a team of staff to work together on this process um, alongside, and it's clear, it's very important to say this, alongside both trusts because we have no part to play in this. This will be for the trustees themselves to decide. OK, Barry. Um, I think so. Just uh, as I say, um, it could well be that we spend this money uh, and, and it doesn't deliver what we really need to see. And I think I would want just a, you know, some guarantees or as much as possible about that. And I think a way of doing that might well be um, that 
we would look to have the both sets of trusts um, enter into negotiations, maybe as part of this funding. OK, thank you. Uh, Councillor Boyd. Thanks, Provost. Ideally, I would have liked to see the Galleon move back, set the costs are prohibitive. Um, so refurbishing the Galleon seems to be the kind of sensible option. I've met with Steady twice to discuss the plans. I'm really impressed. We've got a really excellent general manager there. The plan's really good. You know, I think, see, when you walk past, you don't really know there's a swimming pool and ice rink there. So some of his ideas to open them up to the street are good. Um, the gym round the back at Douglas Street's good. I think that's good having a separate entrance. But just maybe need to look at a second car park in that area. Car parking's a problem. And the only other wee point I would make is the cafe is proposed to be in the first floor. And I've, I've discussed this with Steria. He said that's because the offices would be in the ground floor. I think we could spot these over. Really, you want a cafe to be of ease of access. You know, MD with mobility issues, people with push chairs, etc. You want it in the ground floor, maybe glass fronted, opening onto Titchfield Street with maybe some outdoor seating. So that, that's really the only thing I would kind of um, suggest. That. Other than that, you know, I think we, we look at what we're proposing the 400,000, then hopefully go. And I think, given the cost of inflation, we really need to move in this and, and start getting contractors appointed and getting the job done because we don't want the cost to rise even further with it in this envelope. Thank you. No, the good ideas about getting a, a frontage, raise that with the trustees. Yep. Councillor Adams. Thanks, Chair. Just a couple of brief points, um, aware of the time constraints. I'm conscious we're being asked to sign off on something that will not fully address the Council's climate change and net zero ambitions. So that's us signing off something that we've set our own targets and we're not going to meet. I'm really concerned about that. Uh, I think that needs to be looked into further. And, and secondly, to uh, agree with Councillor Douglas, I do think it is time uh, to look at merging of the trusts. We're a fairly small local authority in the grand scheme of things and to have East Ayrshire Council, East Ayrshire Leisure Trust and the Galleon Leisure Trust all operating within the same sector. I think it requires looking at uh, sooner rather than later uh, to streamline services and perhaps reduce costs. Thank you. Councillor Maitland. Thank you. Just um, uh, on what uh, Councillor Douglas and Councillor Adams were saying there, I mean, it is within the paper at paragraph 17 that we are looking at merging the trusts at some point or looking at the positions of the trust. It's already within the papers there and also the potential to become a scale, which is probably more important at this point. So it is within the papers and the scope of the papers. Thank you. Good points, folks. Leader. No, I absolutely agree 100%. It's something we should absolutely look at and there, there could be cost savings there and my goodness will need them. Uh, but it's important that we, we empower this group and, you know, we've and we get this paper out now uh, so that we're moving fast because that's a substantial amount of investment. It's probably one of the biggest amounts of investment that we have available to really give the town centre uh, of Kilmarnock a, a, real, a real boost and really help the well-being of the community as well. So the sooner we can get people empowered to do this, the better. Thank you, Councillor McFadden. You know, obviously we have to spend the money to design it, but as Councillor Douglas says, you'd hate to spend the four hundred odd thousand pounds and then find out it's something we don't like or it's just not viable. So I mean that strikes me as a lot of money anyway, but I just uh, as well as thanking Simon and the officers for the group, could it be that, you know, the design process as it goes along could be reported back to us that, you know, once they've done an initial look, that they clarify that it's all feasible. So maybe they spend fifty thousand pounds, and we know that everything is feasible. And then you know, then they continue rather than spend our four hundred thousand pounds with no input until the four hundred thousand pounds is spent. I'd I'd like to know it's feasible and what the rough proposals are. I'd like increments of where we're going with the four hundred grand, so we we like it when we're and not surprised by it. I think that's what Joe alluded to when when he when he when he gave the answer that. It would be keeping a, a magnifying glass on that, Simon. Yeah, thanks, Provost. And just to kind of pick up one or two points, uh, the the intention uh, is, as Joe outlined, to take forward um, a design process that will come back with a suite of options that we can then look at and and consider what is the best in terms of the financial investment for the building. Um, 
we are endeavouring to set a pathway to net zero and the current costs that have been estimated do uh, include elements on that pathway. And so what we want to get as part of this suite of options, as well as refurbishment proposals for the facilities within the galleon, is environmental proposals for the sustainability options, um, which will form that suite of, of proposals and costs that will allow us to take a more informed, allow Council to take a more informed view and um, decision on it. Um, it, it could be that uh, in actual fact we set a, a, a process in place that, that might require some further work. What I'm thinking about just now is that it's still questionable about whether um, the main energy source may be electricity or perhaps it may be hydrogen and therefore we could be looking at installing boilers that are convertible for a hydrogen fuel, fuel source or be looking at um, electrical sources and indeed um, uh, heat pump technologies. So part of this um, design exercise will start to inform that and come back with, with uh, um, the technical information uh, around about that, as well as, as I say, the reorganisation of the facilities within the, the, the Gallian Centre itself. Hope that's helpful. Happy with that. Councillor Mackay. Uh, first of all, just to pick up very quickly on, on just something that uh, Simon said. Uh, again, we've already got at the HALO project, uh, I understand, a very good example of storage that we have got from wind power. And I think that's something that we really do need to move forward on. I'm sure that's part of what Simon was thinking of when he was uh, talking about the uh, electricity so actually managing to actually store electricity which comes from our wind farms and i'm sure we could come up with some very innovative ways of looking and understanding fully what the community benefits could be from that uh, would be a very excellent way forward again simon just for some detailed uh, further questioning uh, and again picking up on councillor mcfadgen's point what I am hoping is that we will be able to get a report back to us in the April and May, uh, or just after the April and May 2023, which is set there at paragraph 37, uh, which gives us basically a costing on what the feasibility proposals are, and then actually then allows us to give some instruction for that if we move on to the concept design uh, proposals. So just for confirmation that it would be possible to actually set out the contract so as that there is that opportunity to report back to us at Council. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Simon, yep. We can we can set the um, commission up on that basis that we could report back at that point, Councillor Mackay. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's appropriate. Thank you. Councillor Douglas. Thank you, Provost. And uh, just going back to the point I made earlier, and I know uh, what Councillor Maitland has said in relation to the paper that discussions are taking place. Perhaps um, it is now the time where we add to that recommendation then that we absolutely, in principle, will you know, propose that £400,000, happy to support that, but that steps are taken to formalise any move between the trusts, um, perhaps compel them, in fact, probably the best way to put it, um, to, to take those steps as a condition of council funding. Thanks. Well, well, I wouldn't go as far as that, Councillor Douglas. I'm a trustee and there, there are trustees on the board. It's ultimately up to the trustees to decide that. that we can enter into negotiations, absolutely. Uh, but I don't think you can compel trustees to, to do something. Councillor Linton. It was on that very point. I mean, I think, you know, we're all in this together. I think the trustees, both elected members that are trustees and also members of the public, our trustees should have a say in it. And it also leaves us, you know, with the unanswered decision today of visions. You know, you know, if we do this today 
as Barry suggests, then you know we're not taking a decision on visions based on refurbishment of the galleon. So I think it's it's a bigger question. I appreciate your sentiment, Barry. I think it's a decision that we have to take, and it's as it is clear as already mentioned, it's contained in the paper. But I think you know there's there's a bigger picture here. So I would maybe urge a wee bit of caution in that. But I think you know what what has been said is 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 accurate. No, Barry, did you hear those thoughts? No, no, I hear those thoughts and I absolutely accept that the two sets of trusts would need to uh, agree that. But again, then perhaps that's something we can do as, as, as a condition of the funding is that we ask both sets of trusts to maybe accelerate discussions in that regard. Well, we're, we're asked to make recommendations. Are you asking that that's included in the recommendations? Yes, promise. Thanks. Well, 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 I'll, we'll get some uh, advice for uh, the, the solicitor here. Is that? August, uh, members, if council wanted to attach reasonable conditions to the funding, then council can attach reasonable conditions to the funding. If council thinks it's reasonable to in, invest this money in the building which sits in ground the council owns, but the council doesn't own the building, and the report makes that clear, and that can be dealt with either way, it's not an obstacle. But if council wanted to make it a condition of the funding that it was contingent on the amalgamation of the trust, it would be an option for council, but it is something council would want to properly have information in front of it before taking that decision. Bearing in mind that it is something council looked at before and eventually we stepped back from because there were costs uh, previously associated with bringing the trust together that were at the time considered prohibitive in the region of about £600,000. So it's not a new issue, it's an issue council has looked at before. Uh, the report rightly identifies it as an issue uh, council may want to look at again. And one option would be, in terms of competence, and I'm not, again, I'm not buying or selling, would be uh, to make that a condition of the funding or uh, simply to enter into more broad negotiations and discussions and deliver that anyway, whether it's a condition of the funding or not. If all parties agree, there is merit in not continuing to operate with two independent leisure trusts and a CF. No, thanks for that. So, probably when you say these, just, just I know people mentioned the difference is the KLDC is the statutory predecessor of East Ayrshire set up the Galleon Trust in 1987. East Ayrshire set up the East Ayrshire Leisure Trust. The Visions Trust was set up independently by other folk. So, I, I would distinguish mm -hmm. the visions from the two of the councils. Well, in, one inherited and one created. No, thanks. Uh, yeah, Eddie. Uh, thanks, Provost. Uh, members have already indicated they would like to see a report back in this at the end of you know, um, April, May, in terms of where we are with the, with the design uh, proposals. Would members be content to also see you know, a report back at that time in progress with paragraph 17, you know, in terms of where we are, in terms of work around you know, the, the governance arrangements? So we would be bringing a report back at that time that gave progress in both in terms of the building and the governance arrangements, and members were content you know, around that rather than you know, like anything wider than that. I would agree with that, Eddie. Yeah. No, no, thanks. Thanks for that, Barry. That's great. Uh, leader? I, mean, I think it's quite reasonable to ask, you know, that, that council asked for, you know, uh, early discussion on the matter, but rather than any kind of pull short of compelling trustees, what you do, I don't think we're, but I think, you know, we're all minded that we want to have an early discussion on, on this. No, uh, I, I, happy, I, I, I agree. <laughs> I think that's the best way forward. I'll just a wee bit with the compelling, that was all, Barry. Uh, uh, you want back in? No, I'm, con I'm content that from what the Chief Executive has said that we can wrap that into uh, the report when it comes back at feasibility stage. I think we can then hear the progress and as a, as a council before we commit to quite considerable tens of millions of pounds of funding potentially, we can make a decision then. That gives both sets of trusts independently their, their time and rightly so. So no, I'm happy with that. Thanks, Provost. Right, thank you. Any other comments? This paper... Recommendations are there, agree. Thank you. Right, on to item eight three, the repurposing of the multi story site within Kilmarnock Town Centre, and it's Kevin. Thank you, Provost. 
The purpose of this report is to provide Council with the options for repurposing of the multi-storey site aligned to the potential future development of Kilmarnock Town Centre. Paragraph C to 9 give the background to the multi-storey and the decision to demolish, provision of the new car parts and the, and the infinity loop linked to active travel. The development of the spinal route will provide direct access to public transport facilities, the Kilmarnock Active Travel Hub, all of our major parts and the facilities associated with the town centre. It will also allow for a figure of eight route providing greater choice for locals and visitors using the green infrastructure network. The spinal route will be used to celebrate the life and work of one of Kilmarnock's most famous sons, Johnny Walker, and will encourage users of the route to visit and explore some, some significant sites and places of interest. Paragraphs 10 to 14 provide detail around LDP 2017, the Regional Transport Strategy and EV charging. The role of the Kilmarnock Town Centre is to support commercial and civic uses and to provide a hub for culture, tourism, retail and transport services. Its challenges and opportunities are identified as changes in consumer pa patterns, increased attractiveness, introduce the nighttime economy and improvements that reduce the barrier effect of the one-way system. Given its prime location in the town centre and its, and its exceptional pedestrian, cyclist and public transport connectivity, it is advised that all future uses of the site should be for a purpose that will help improve the vibrancy of the town centre and which contribute to delivering Kilmarnock's strategic priorities. East Ayrshire is covered by the Regional Transport Partnership, managed by Strathclyde Partnership for Transport, SPT, and SPT's Regional Transport Strategy outlines four key transport outcomes it mm. hopes to achieve. Improve connectivity, access for all, reduced emissions and attractive, seamless, reliable travel. The Council highlights the need for local and national funding in order to improve the public transport and active travel network while also providing facilities for e-vehicles and a future paper will, paper will be presented on a Pan Ayrshire EV public charging strategy in the new year. The East Ayrshire Council, sorry, sorry, the East Ayrshire Young People's Cabinet have raised their concerns around the climate crisis and want to accelerate change. They played a key role in developing East Ayrshire Council's first climate strategy climate change strategy and are very supportive of active travel investment which supports carbon reduction. Paragraphs 15 to 25 detail the short-term option, and that is to create an EV hub, a civic space constructed with high-quality public realm materials with landscaping, including public art and, and historical interpretation of the town, with clear access links to the infinity loop and public transport hubs, rail and bus, support and active travel and emission reduction. This would be shaped by engagement with local stakeholders, with a working group to be established for this purpose, with future reports brought forward to reflect progress, and the timescale would be two years from completion of demolition. Paragraph 26 is a medium-term option to further develop the area with mixed tenure housing on the existing car parks in Green Street for private affordable and social rented units. The purpose of mixed tenure Development would encourage greater social, economic and community mix to support a thriving and sustainable community within the town centre with a potential time scale of two to seven years. Paragraph 27 to 28 is a long term option with further housing and remodelling the traffic flows around Green Street, Sula Street, Union Street, High Street and Surrock Street. This will improve journey times and provide direct routes within the town, removing the dominant one-way directional network, which is perceived to hinder the economy and development of the town centre, with a potential timescale of two to ten years. It is recommended that Council approves the redevelopment of the multi-storey footprint to create an EV charging and cycling hub with civic space, approves public consultation in the future phases of development of the broader site to contribute to the regeneration of Kilmarnock Town Centre, and approves the commissioning of a master plan and traffic modelling based on the proposed long-term options and otherwise notes the contents of the report. Thank you, Provost. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, folks, for open it out for discussion, questions, uh, please, if you have any ideas, we would be here all day listening to those ideas. Could you include them in the public consultation for future phases? If there are any policy, uh, absolutely uh, ask ask away. Council Maitland. Thank you, Provost. Um, I'm delighted that we're going to have a master plan. Um, I'm not going to offer any ideas for what to do at the moment, but however, I would like it to include 
the possibility, especially in the two to 10 years, and what we're still facing in our town centre, which is rat running, commuter parking, jammed car parks, and making it very difficult to live and work in the town. I would have raised this at the earlier paper, but we got involved in the floral clock. Thank you. Thank you much, Councillor Boyd. Uh, thanks, Kevin, for the paper. The multi-story can't come down quick enough. I know it's been delayed, um, so the sooner it comes down, the better. But to move on from that, um, the car park and, and the road. Um, presently, I think, including the multi-story, if we could use it, there's about a 1,000 parking spaces in the town. Um, I can get that confirmed from Ada. When we looked, at, when the town was rebuilt in the 70s, the idea was for 4,000 car parking spaces. No, so we're actually four times less than that. The town was to be much bigger. That's why we have a problem with the one-way system in Green Street and Sturrock Street. It was built for the town. Comarnock and Irvine were meant to be more or less one city. The plans are all there. So we're, we're stuck, and that's the word, we're stuck with a one-way system. It's completely out of date. So I completely welcome um, the plan there, you know, um, that Kevin's proposed um, with Green Street, Solar Street, because, you know, if you're going to London Road to the railway station, you're going right round, it would reduce carbon. Um, just one wee thing to ask, Kevin, um, paragraph 26, developing the existing car parks in Green Street for housing. I'm not averse to that because I do think we need housing in the town centre, but if we remove that car park, I guess that before Gate North or maybe some others in that vicinity, how would we replace them? I know we might not have any concrete ideas, but I'm just kind of floating these thoughts at the moment. That's all. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's a fair, fair point, Kevin. Thank you, Councillor. Through you, Provost, I mean, we would look at the car park and as the wider traffic model in the town centre, and that's how it would be tackled. Thank you, Provost. Councillor McFarland. Sorry, this is a slight idea, but not not what to do with the site. It's just when we demolish the car park itself, all the concrete, can we look to see whether there's any feasible use of the material for any building up any low lying areas, any of our flood defences? I mean, if the crushed cement can be reused instead of paying for it to be shipped off site and then buying in other materials, can we just look at what what happens to the actual waste material? Given. Through you, Provost Councillor, we, we will be using the ICE protocol for demolition, and that requires us to look at recycling all the materials that we can within the demolition process. That includes pipe work, you know, steel work, um, and and the concrete frame itself. Thank you, Provost. Oh no, thank you, and and all leader. Thanks, thanks, Provost. I, I just did. Yeah, just, I wasn't was going to make, come back to it, but just to Graham's point, I was interested to know when we got the award from the as the most improved town, uh, the Scott Scotland Towns Partnership indicated to us that there was far too much uh, dedicated parking spaces, and that was one of the, the criticisms that they had for their town. But I'll just maybe note that, and uh, you know, things change. But whatever we do, hopefully we can do it kind of sensitively and involve local people. But the one like in paragraph nine, and I'm not letting them off the hook. Uh, we mentioned Johnny Walker. You know, we did a, we've done a great job, uh, at, you know, at re restoring the graveyard at St Andrews Kirk. And, you know, it's great to tell Johnny Walker's story. And thankfully, somebody's telling us, no, it doesn't seem to be the adjo at the moment. Certainly, no, the £183 million pound place in Princess Street. But, uh, and there is a story, nevertheless, whatever, you know, the adjo come and go. Uh, John Walker was born and bred just outside Kilmarnock. And uh, that's something we'll always be proud of. But I don't, I don't suppose, Provost, if, if members permit that, I might be right to the uh, to Diageo and maybe ask them for, uh, to come down and a visit and just see if they'd be prepared to maybe put their, their hands in their pockets because, uh, you know, any any contributions are entirely welcome. Good luck with that, Leader. Well done. Right, right to them. And just the uh, last one, Kevin, uh, can we keep the, the sculpture... Please find a, a metal sculpture, find a, a really nice use for that somewhere. Do you promise we would take that into account in terms of the consultation with the wider community? Thank you. Great answer. Folks, is there any any further points? Councillor Mackay. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, so just for some clarity then, 
Uh, I take it that this is something which is going to come within the remit of the strategic group going forward. Through you, Provost, yes, that, that's, that's, the, that's the plan. That's great. Thanks very much. That's super. Thanks, Maureen. Yeah, that was my understanding as well. Um, folks, I'm going to ask for a comfort break. We've got uh, one o'clock. I can ask you to be back for quarter past one. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>